The original upload of this video was deleted by YouTube for a very dumb reason, so I've decided to re-upload it here because I think it's a very important story to tell. So without further ado, this is Too Mad Was Alone. Oh, oh hey, I'm just about to go to bed. I know we couldn't Skype tonight, but that's all right. Good night, girl. I'll see you tomorrow. Too Mad was one of the most talented YouTubers of his generation. In a few short years, he went from a literal nobody to having millions of subscribers. He was featured by PewDiePie, collaborated with Max Mofo, Anything for Views, Jay Schlatt, and other extremely popular legacy creators. His audience was loyal, following him to any platform or medium. And his style of comedy influenced millions of people during a time when they were all locked inside and wearing masks. On February 14th, 2024, he was found dead of what was presumed to be an overdose. When Overwatch was released in 2016, it quickly became one of the most popular games in the world, with every content creator hopping on the bandwagon to try and capitalize. One such aspiring creator was a young man named Medea Sadiq, a 16-year-old boy living in Winnipeg, Canada. Now, Winnipeg is cold as f sometimes, so he had a lot of time to stay inside, and at the time, he was also lacking any real-life connection whatsoever. According to Tumad himself, he was basically mute throughout his time in school and barely had a single friend. He was constantly getting into fights with people and just had a very hard time growing Growing up. The friends he did have were called Sony Vegas and Premiere Pro, so he got cooking. Inspired by old MLG montage parodies and YouTube poops, he began making what can only be called schizophrenic edits of Overwatch gameplay. He had opened his channel in April of 2016, and the growth from there was pretty steady, racking up around 10,000 subscribers a year later. In just two months, he grew to 160,000 subscribers, thanks to a few of his edits really popping off. How to Doomfist, Nerf Lucio, and Rip Roadhog got millions of views within a few weeks of posting. On Twitter, he thanked his new viewers for the massive growth. But he wasn't about to slow down. His time had come, and he needed to seriously keep momentum going if he was going to maintain this strong new viewer base. He didn't spend his money, he didn't party, he sank into his computer chair a little deeper and cranked out video after video week after week. By January of 2018, he had 450,000 subscribers. Just one year later, he doubled it. By this time, his videos had also gotten much longer. Instead of posting one minute long edits, he was posting 10 minute gaming videos with his editing and commentary mixed in. I look at the water and I feel the castle. <laughs> I go to the fridge and I take me the goat. I go to my egg box and I turn it back home. <laughs> I get my reflection, then I shoot that thing. Yeah. <laughs> This editing with constant bruh noises, random sound effects, and memes thrown in became extremely influential, with a lot of other editors taking note. There truly was never a dull moment in these videos. They were great for keeping viewers engaged. In an age where every Zoomer's attention span is less than 12.4 milliseconds, keeping people locked in was really important, and Tumad, intentionally or unintentionally, was a master at it. Oh, oh, oh get wrecked. Okay, let's go, let's go. One more left. Let me show you how good Blitz really is, bro. Flash! The last thing you'd want in your kitchen. Can you stick? Can you stick? How do you want to make it? Sure. By June of 2017, he already had 100,000 subscribers from his Overwatch edits. At the same time, he had been streaming on Twitch where he cycled through Overwatch, Rainbow Six Siege, Fortnite, and really whatever game was really pulling in new viewers at the time. His personality was slowly but surely getting out there, and it helped that his manner of speaking was basically in line with his editing, constantly quoting different memes, movies, games, songs, never staying in one place or on one topic for more than 15 seconds. He was definitely unique and viewers loved it. In February of 2019, he did a Facebook reveal on Twitch, which on YouTube got a million and a half views. Literally every black person in f***ing existence is going to be mentioned. They're going to say Obama. They're going to say X. They're going to say T'Challa. They're going to say who else is black? Nelson Mandela. Nelson Mandela? Who else? Thanos? He's like, he's half black. He's mixed so... So now his face and his personality were out there on full display, giving him a golden opportunity to move from being just an editor to a media sensation. And that all really started with Good Night Girl. Good night, girl. I'll see you tomorrow.
The goodnight girl meme came at the perfect time. Just a few months out from his face reveal, his audience was already familiarized with his appearance. This video, which portrays him as a lonely simp or discord mod, telling his e-kitten it's alright she deprived him of attention, went absolutely viral. Instagram, Twitter, Reddit, 4chan, you name it, it was posted there to millions upon millions of views. And the clip itself is not, like, standalone, it's from a compilation of similarly cringe and hilarious bra moments. <laughs> What's interesting is that this was not accidental. It was a calculated move by Tumad that he created in one take. I put the camera angle, the, sh the, the webcam mic is so shit, so I was like, alright, this audio is gonna be perfect. And then it took one take, it was just one take, one single take, where I just go up and I start saying some shit, shit, all on the spot. I don't know what the fuck I was saying, I was like, ah, go to Skype, nah. And I just did that, and I just, ah, I just, like, I literally just let my legs slip under me, and I just fell straight on the ground. There's nothing there. The memes he would use, like the Baba Booey sound effect. Do you think that, like, North Korea is gonna pick it up and send an ICBM to my Baba Canadian house? <laughs> Saying bruh constantly. Bruh. And his poor impression of various ethnicities similarly spread across the internet and became synonymous with his brand. <laughs> Around this time, the original 2Mad channel was renamed to 2Mad360, and his old second channel became his new main. He also expanded his content from just gaming videos to literally everything. Live streams of him trying to sleep while his viewers sent text-to-speech donations to bully him. You laugh, you lose videos where he would challenge his viewers to make him chuckle, with the prize being thousands of dollars, IRL videos of him acting like a psychopath while riding an electric scooter, then his neighbor stole that electric bike, so he tried to get the police to kick the door down, which they would not do, so he left them a troll face with a note asking for them to give it back. This dude literally lives right beside me and I can't do shit about it but leave him a goddamn letter, what the fuck, man. 1984, I'm gonna leave him a stack of money too, fuck it, I'll give him everything he wants. Beep, boop, 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 boop. Let's not put our face in the camera. The <laughs> Your photo is required. <laughs> I just showed him Obama at work. What company are you delivering for? Uh, Bob it. Building management. Bob gives me his name too. Thank you for that information. There we go. Let's open that up. Leave him the letter. Give him that lock. So you know you can give it back. There you go, buddy. And we'll give him a little bit of money too. Give him about like five bow bucks. In the ting, yeet. And lock him up. Goodbye. Any random event from his life would become content. He went out of his way to enrage sensitive fan bases like K-pop stands. Now, well, dude, now you see this has 6.2 likes, right? There were like two other tweets with like 20k likes trying to get my s removed. <laughs> he was really killing it in the content department. At this time, he was also taking prescription Adderall to focus. He describes his thought process naturally as extremely random and all over the place. This drug allowed him to lock in creatively and actually get things done. I'm on fucking ADHD. HD meds. Are you? What are you on right now? Dexedrine. Dexedrine. 10 milligram. Daily dose. I, I have never even heard of Dexedrine. That sounds intense. Generic Adderall. Is it fun though? It's not necessarily fun. It more like it's like it's essential to function. It makes. Oh, do, do you like uh, do you like need like Adderall to function on day to day? Adderall is. It, 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 tell you why I don't need it, but it's probably a lot better if I use it. Otherwise, yeah. I'll just be like bra moment all day, just like hello. I'm Bruh. thinking of literally the world. He was also smoking a considerable amount of weed at this time. Those are the only need. Good Kush and alcohol. I, wait, I wake and bake and I'm just like, I don't need shit. But this cocktail for the time being didn't seem to affect him negatively. It allowed him to push past whatever his mental problems were to make content on a consistent basis. While his popularity was rising, Too Mad was also on the move. Due to some complications with living with his family, he planned to move to Los Angeles, California. And one content creator who offered for him to move in was none other than James Key. Welcome back to another episode of N-Word News. Did Too Mad really say the N-Word? Well, according to Jameski, he did, but the thing is, um... Too mad black. Jameski is a content creator who similarly came from a gaming background. You probably know him from his Uganda Knuckles VR chat videos that blew up a few years ago. These guys seemingly have a similar sense of humor and style of content. So where was their disagreement? In October of 2019, Too Mad began tweeting out claiming Jameski was actually Russian and not Danish as he claimed to be. This kind of became a meme at the time with a lot of people spamming Russian text at him. James did not take this lightly and decided to post a big twit longer outlining his side of the story. James says he offered Too Mad a place to stay. 
Madea, but their relationship had been deteriorating in the lead up to this move. He said that he hadn't spoken to Medea for a few months because he knowingly and purposely was harassing him over his PTSD speech problems. He said Tumad would go as far as to mock him for sounding alike to terrorists. Apparently, this really hurt his feelings coming from a friend. He also said that he would often use the N-word to farm emotes and chat, even though James asked him not to do it because it made a lot of people uncomfortable. He dropped the hard R multiple times in text, chat, and voice during streams, which is one of the reasons why they stopped streaming together. Now, to criticize Tumad for using this word is dumb because, one, based, and two, he's black, so in the eyes of the world, he should be able to say it. No! Can you shout out my son, Nick? But it appears James's problem was less to do with the word itself and more to do with the potential of a Twitch ban when it's uttered. James also said Tumad would constantly make fun of him during his Rainbow Six Siege tournament, which made him very uncomfortable. He felt it went beyond basic banter and it genuinely hurt him. Despite this, he agreed to let Medea move into his home in LA. But as the move-in date got closer, he apparently was warned by people about Tumad. All of my friends said they didn't have a pleasant experience with Tumad or knew somebody who would have a word or two about it. Without dropping names, all of the friends I spoke to collectively said they wouldn't let Tumad in their house. But I imagine it's biased based on their experience with him. Tumad is known for being vengeful, harassing people behind their backs, and leaking private conversations with malicious intents. After this, he decided to call Tumad to make sure he actually wanted to move to Los Angeles for the right reasons. We called him to ask him this question because we wanted to make sure he's not going to regret his sudden decision to move to a foreign country without a proper plan. First of all, his getting kicked out within a few months suddenly changed to, I just want to move out, and that he wants to move to LA because it's where you make it big. Huge twist of the situation if you ask me. We tried to explain to him that Los Angeles is extremely expensive and that he's going to live here at a loss and it might not meet his expectations. As I mentioned earlier, he just insisted that we wait until he gets partnered, yada yada. He also made a Patreon a few minutes after our call, which is probably the right decision. So the plans to move in were still on. Too Mad was to attend TwitchCon 2019, at which time he would also swing by the house to check it out. But during the actual event, they didn't get to hang out as much as James would have liked because of a complication with Too Mad missing his initial flight. His reason for not getting on a plane was because there was a guy who had a turban. I hope it's a joke, but knowing his racist attitude, I doubt it is. So TwitchCon that year was in San Diego, which is a two and a half hour drive from Los Angeles where the house is. James had to return early because his friend Scott got food poisoning. So while busy with that, Tumad messaged him saying he was coming by the house to see it and will be staying with them. According to James, this was somewhat uninvited. Tumad suddenly messaged me, see you at your house in LA on October 2nd, to which I responded that me and Scott might be at the hospital and can't hang out as our flu was getting worse. He didn't care about how we feel or what we're going through. He said that he's still coming and that he's going to stay in my house for five days. I called him out on his dumb assumption and he began to guilt trip me for spending hundreds of dollars and that he can't even show up. Just a clarification that I never said he can't come, I was only confused about his intentions. After making it clear that I'm not claiming he can't come, just might not be able to stay by himself at the house if I'm at a hospital, and I asked him to clarify the part where I told him he could stay at my place, he showed screenshots where I mentioned that the corner room is reserved for him, since he specifically wanted it and that there's no furniture including no mattress. I explained to him that it's just a miscommunication, and it's not like I wouldn't let you in the house, but you should be more clear next time, alright? He started guilt tripping me even more. At the time I didn't realize he was just being manipulative, and I offered to pay full price for a hotel stay, and case I'm at a hospital and he can't stay at my place. A week in Los Angeles at a hotel is $1,000 to $2,000 if you book it at the last moment, by the way. He continued guilt tripping me. After a few hours, I told him that if he promises to take full responsibility for the house, I can let him stay in my room, even if I'm at the hospital. He told me he promised and reminded me it would be cool if I pay for his hotel. So Tumad flies to San Diego, but says he has a place to stay, so he doesn't have to stay with James or stay somewhere James would pay for. James was hurt. Tumad had been ghosting his messages in LA and not hanging out with him. In San Diego, he tried to get Medea to go to the zoo with him, and Tumad apparently continued the same behavior despite being there to visit the house, which caused James sleep deprivation as he was really stressed out and confused. Later, James had planned a trip across the world to Australia and wanted to hang out there with Medea. Apparently, James messaged him asking if the two would be hanging out, at which point he just said, sex immediately, before giving him a fake address of where he was staying to mess with him. The same kind of stuff continued while there. Tumad said to James he was staying with a friend from Canada, when in reality, he was staying with anything for views. James, upset, messaged him saying the following. You really think it's fair to lie to me for two weeks for absolutely no reason? What happened? Too mad then sent a cringe.mp4 file he deleted immediately and then just sent a really shitty image of Captain
Captain America saying, no, I don't think I will. Yeah, I mean, that sounds like something too mad would do. <laughs> Eventually, James messaged anything for views about the situation. I spoke to Chad about this briefly. At no point did I say anything like, don't talk to too mad, yada yada. I just shared my experience and how I feel about it. When Chad was saying that everything seems fine, I told him that's all that matters and I'm just sharing my experience. I don't know what Chad told too mad, but a few minutes later, too mad wrote a 1000 word rant about what a bad person I am. He twisted the situation multiple times and tried to guilt trip me really hard, but it didn't work this time because I could see everything right through. The cherry on top was quit the pettiness. This is literally the definition of high school drama, just leave me alone, man. I didn't bring this to the public because I didn't want drama. I didn't want our viewers to be involved and I thought he was just a scum person who will move on after this. The only people who knew about the situation at the time were people who were around both of us and just saw it slowly develop. At no point did I call anyone up to get them against too mad. The only conversations were just me sharing my experience and asking for advice because at the time I didn't realize I was being manipulated. Pretty ironic because too mad allegedly went ahead and started trying to get people against me behind my back almost immediately. Despite the just leave me alone man part he said to me, he was tweeting at me all morning, targeting not just my tweets but also replies to my fans. He blocked me on Twitter so I couldn't even see his replies. Worth mentioning he has been deleting some of the Discord messages and then edited his manipulative rant. Good thing Discord shows the time of his edits. He also deleted me everywhere right after I got no contact with him. After reading all of this, I bet a lot of you are asking, who? cares. I mean, Too Mad was known for roasting and talking people in game, so that's expected. The situation with dodging James and ghosting him is definitely mean, but nothing that needed to be made public. Overall, kind of a nothing burger. James did not acknowledge the fake Russian claims at all in this, which definitely threw some people through a loop. This twit longer is 3,200 words. It's almost the full length of a YouTube video. So why does it even exist? You could say it's because James felt attacked by the Russian thing, but then why not address it instead of whatever else this is all about? So Too Mad responds with a video on his YouTube channel. He opens by reiterating his claim that James pretended to be Danish when in fact he is Russian. To prove this, he shows old footage of Jameski under a different username speaking fluent Russian to Russian YouTuber Nef Want actual footage of him speaking fluent Russian? Here you go, No fuckers has a lot of it because they used to be friends until dun dun, the meme happened, I'm Danish. <laughs> Every trace of conversation in Russia with no fuckers, fucking purged. Why you might ask? Knows I'm not trying to get assassinated. He also claims that James got his Twitter taken down for making fun of him. Considering that it's a really good theory that you got my Twitter terminated, you literally deplatformed me for calling you out for being Russian. Why did I call you out for being Russian? Because you called my current roommate anything for views, asked him if he was alone, and then proceeded to tell him that I took advantage of you. I'm a clout chaser. I must warn you of too mad. All I do is make videos with my titties out. Leave me the f alone. I tried to resolve it privately, but you didn't respond. So yeah, I've never seen someone get banned for something this tame. Without outer input from James Ski, how would a Twitter employee know that I'm trying to spread hate or violence when I'm not even doing that? As for the sh talking, Medea frames what he said to James as casual sh talking that was taken too seriously, causing him to freak out during both tournaments they did and behind the scenes. Despite his perspective that James was a somewhat sensitive person, he needed a place to stay, so he was open to moving in with him. As for why he made his tweets about James, well, he took James calling Chad to talk about him is a manipulative move to turn his friends against him. As for not wanting to hang out with James, I'd say he pretty much owned that one. I just didn't want to hang out. I'd give you excuses over and over. You just wouldn't pick up on the queue. You wanted to force it. You were so insecure that I didn't like you. And if I didn't meet up with you in real life, you would just start spreading shit. And that's exactly what the f*** you did. You crossed the line and you started spreading garbage, vile shit to people who are important to me in order to manipulate them. Now, during James's twit longer, he had an issue with not believing Too Mad's intentions for wanting to leave. Too Mad shows a message he had sent James trying to resolve things where he said he was consistent that the reason he needed to leave Winnipeg was because he was in a toxic household where his dad was attacking him regularly, which is why the cops were called there. Too Mad claimed in this long message he got red flags when James took his banter too seriously and also that when he had joked about the Russian thing among friends, James freaked out, which once again gave him cold feet and made him believe he was hiding something, which is why he didn't want to hang out with him. His real problem with James started when he messaged Chad and other friends to talk about him. Too Mad says that James's lack of evidence for the events that went down is very telling of the truth. He says here I lied to him and a mutual friend about getting kicked out of my house and will never know who because you guessed it. He was claiming he's only got a few months and he needs help to move to Los Angeles. This is a complete manufactured 
fucking narrative. I had zero interest to move to Los Angeles. I wanted to go anywhere in the fucking continent. Like I said before, Jameski was just the first person to offer, and he ended up being in LA, and that's why I wanted to go to LA. Not the other way around, like Jameski says it. This is how he tries to convince you that I'm a cloud chaser. He admits to saying the N-word, but said it's because it's just a part of his vocabulary, and James could just kick him off the stream if he thinks he's being out of line or going to cause a ban. He also says he did make fun of James, but nothing resembling harassment. Him making fun of James was more him making fun of the Russian accent instead of his PTSD speech problems. No, Jameski, I did not make fun of your speech problems. At worst, your accent! Once again, he's making it look like I had some sort of issue against his health problems, which I had no idea about, and frankly can't tell exist. I'm sure I was being a prick. A prick solely for entertainment, to be toxic, for the stream, which I explained to you while I was apologizing profusely in the call we had the day after. You're bringing it up just to make me look bad. You're actually trying to convince people that I actually meant what I said. He goes on to disagree with the majority of James's retelling and ends the video with this. End of the day, what did we learn? Jameski's Russian. Jameski will lie about his entire identity, so why believe about everything else? If you're gonna believe Jameski, get receipts. Don't blindly believe people. You f if you're under the age of 14 and you blindly believe Twit longers, you get a pass. But if you're over 14, I prescribe you with children brain. James responded with another twit longer. Just make a video, bro. You're really gonna make me read this. Well, it is my job, so big bullet points. During the drama, Too Mad said that after his video, James would come out and threaten to off himself. James sees this as an immature comment. He claims he did not mass flag or report at Too Mad. It was actually Maximilian Muss. The real reason James was mad about the tournament in the recording Too Mad shows is because he had invited someone James does not like, which made him uncomfortable. He rebuttals too mad saying he was never kicked out of his house with a DM of him saying he was. But I guess you could take this to mean he was being forced to move due to circumstances and not literally kicked out if you want to be charitable to Mudea. He shows messages of too mad dodging him when asking to hang out, and the rest is mostly just stuff that is up to interpretation between the two. And he finally responds to the Russian thing. He proceeds to manipulate his audience into a mindset that I always have something to hide, that I flip out whenever someone brings this up and more. The way the video is edited is also very manipulative. He claims that he's a victim and that he dodged a bullet. He claims everyone is afraid to speak out and that he's the only one brave enough to talk about it. He drags the f***ers, Roman, into this. Me and Roman are friends, although we haven't spoken much lately. For the record, I used to study in Russia for a part of my life. It was the worst part of my life experience I ever had. I was also mostly homeschooled. It was around that time when my house was set on fire twice due to arson. Too Mad knows my house was set on fire. Too Mad knows I was hospitalized after. Too Mad knows I had a horrible depression and that my family was broke and that I was extremely distressed. It's worth mentioning that he didn't mention in his video about me living in other countries and he didn't talk about me talking French, broken Suomi, etc. back in the day. Also, it's worth mentioning that I mostly spoke to fuckers in English when he was recording in Russian. Speaking anything but English is outside of my comfort zone, and I will address that later down below. I know some people have made up lies about me, and I didn't want to address it publicly. However, my close friends knew from the beginning my name is James, and it always was. I did study in Russia for a few years, like I mentioned before. It was a horrible experience. No offense towards Russians, it's the life situation more than anything. Too Mad never brought up that I also lived in in Poland, Denmark, most significant, and many other countries. My family moved a lot. Longtime viewers also know I have a bit of a French background and I spoke French in some of my videos. The arson is one of the primary reasons why I had to leave my education to work to support my family. I made it clear many times during my live streams, I can understand multiple languages, but English is the only language I'm comfortable fluently speaking. I never tried to hide it. I don't understand why people stick to that so much. I think this entire beef was extremely dumb. A lot of miscommunication clearly happened. Too Mad probably never lied about why he wanted to go to LA, but James clearly read some things as more definitive and serious than they actually were. James probably did not pretend to be Russian, and this was just a misinterpretation, and Too Mad took his sensitivity around the subject as proof he was lying. James probably called Chad because he was weirded out by Too Mad's behavior, which Too Mad had every right to take personally as some weird way of cutting off his new YouTube connections. To say one person is extremely in the right while the other is not is dumb. Frankly, the reason why Too Mad won this beef is because he's just way funnier than James. But by the end of it, there was no resolution. James hated Too Mad, and Too Mad hated James. And from here, they go their separate ways to continue on with their respective careers as niche internet micro-celebrities.
Shortly after this, during his trip to Australia, one of the first episodes of Cold Ones was released, starring the sleepyhead himself. This is one of the most coherent appearances of Medea ever released. He talks about his experiences during school and even reveals he never finished high school. But I think all parents are like, because they're boomers, man. They don't understand. They're like, you make money on the internet? Like, that makes sense. I have the exact same problem with my parents. Yeah, your dad, right? Yeah. There's like a balance where they're simultaneously trying to look out for you and support Absolutely, like, that's your how passion. my mom was looking at it. But yeah, because like, then it's like, you're a fucking dumb kid. You don't, you're not going to make anything out of this. I want you to, you know, get an education, then maybe blah, blah, blah. They didn't fucking get it. But like, like I said, I didn't even have subs and I knew I'd blow up. I just do it. It's like, definitely a risk, but it's a risk worth taking. I was doing shit school. in school. All I did was get fucking in fights constantly and just can do nothing. It's Everyone cool. wants to be a YouTuber. That's like oh, the top yeah. one yeah, job. It's, it's, yeah, in surveys, it's the most requested job. I'm like, just finish school. Like, it's not going anywhere. Nah, f that. Not always you need to finish school. Like, if you're like me. School, I guarantee you. High school. School is not getting in the way of you making a YouTube video. Depends. Just go to school and f around then. If you're not high interested. School, I, high school probably finished yeah, that. What, I didn't what about finish all it. Those they did a video where they made prank calls. They did a vlog in Los Angeles. And Too Mad continued doing his regular content as well. Now, there are a lot of examples I could give. The guy was at the peak of his creativity and comedic prowess. But my personal favorite thing he did is also probably the most obnoxious out of it all. The Zoom videos. When the pandemic was happening, many students had to take classes online from their home or dorm room to prevent the spread of Bovid 20. So Too Mad would get his fans to send him links to their classrooms and then mess with the teacher by just being himself. Sorry, I mean, class is over. Hi. Uh -huh. Sorry. I'm sorry, you're gonna have a Bubba. stroke. You're too old for this. Leave! 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 Fratana! Fratana Quanpa! Leave, bro! I'm telling you, man! Fucking run! Run! This video got 16 million views, more than double the hits of his second place video on the Too Mad channel. He was absolutely killing it during this time, collaborating with Swagger Souls, Call Me Carson, Super Mega, really anyone who was remotely related to gaming or comedy stuff did something with Too Mad. KSI couldn't stop laughing at his videos. Goodnight Girl was featured in PewDiePie's YouTube Rewind, which got 28 million views. He did a photo shoot with Belle Delphine. As far as influence goes, from 2019 to 2021, he was at the top of his game, and it seemed like no one could stop him. Not K-pop stands, not the principal of a school who he called while pretending to be his viewer's dad so he could justify why he brought Too Mad's N-word past the school. Are people allowed to say the N-word in the school? Um, actually, um, if you look at our code of conduct, there is, it is very specific in there about, um, about, um, somebody making racial slurs. Oh, okay, so it's not allowed, but... Yes, yes, but what you if can you... check our, our... And if you want to look, that's yeah, on our... Yeah. I'll have her give you a call. Wait, if, wait, just one second. Um, If the N-word isn't allowed, uh, what if he has the pass? Does that allow it? Like, the N-word pass? If he has the pass, he can say it, right? What what pass are you, t are you referring to, sir? The n bubble pass, like to say the N-word? I don't know what a mega... What, I don't, I'm kind of confused. You're saying that he would have a card that would allow him to make a racial slur at school? Is that what you're saying? Yes, exactly. And this was a post-edgy YouTube. It wasn't 2016 with Filthy Frank and all of those guys, it was 2020 and 2021, and he just kept the spirit of the golden age alive. He even managed to get healthier and lose some weight. He was mewing, he was looks maxing even. Nice to see. It seemed like nothing could stand in his way, and he would continue on this upward trajectory. Surely someday he would be remembered in the YouTube Hall of Fame as a unique and innovative creator. Until one fateful day when he just stopped posting. The last video on the 2Mad channel was posted in August of 2022. Meanwhile, videos being released on the 2Mad360 channel slowed to a crawl and those that were posted became increasingly low effort. He just wasn't active like he used to be, at least on YouTube. On Twitter, meanwhile, he was posting incessantly, sometimes hundreds of times a day, just posting mostly incoherent bullshit. Not that his tweets weren't already that way, but <laughs> it got really bad during this period. I'm giving many, many thanks to my insatiable horniness, Turkey, and Jesus Lord. Michael Jackson just walked into Subway, they were out of cookies and milk, and he got hangry about it and screamed, but it just sounded high-pitched and funny. Britney Spears just walked into my Subway and won't stop talking in the it's Britney bitch voice. She insists it's her normal speaking voice, but I don't buy it. Now, this was nothing too out of the ordinary for him because his sense of humor was basically just random references repeated anyway. I mean, you know, I'm kind of stupid, so I find it funny. But it did become even more incoherent during this time. He had also stopped uploading, which definitely raised some genuine concern. Meanwhile, his Twitter account turned from just incoherent babble to trying to piss off as many people as possible. It all started with this tweet, where Too Mad tweets out his drawing of Blaze the Cat from the Sonic franchise and his 
is like, hey guys, I made this art, I drew this. The caption is work in progress, and then he tags his own account. And right here on the screen, there's also a mustache covering the original signature, showing that he basically ripped this art from someone's account and then took credit for it. Stealing art isn't funny. You're not fooling anyone. Credit the original artist's post, please. And the fact he's 22 as well, bro fell off from nothing so hard, because he's washed, and doing these shenanigans is the most interaction he's had in weeks. For whatever reason, he was too lazy to actually make content, and was instead passing the time by baiting people on Twitter into being angry at him. And it never became a video like the K-pop thing had in the past, it was all bait with no gain whatsoever, apart from his personal dopamine and enjoyment. This happened in March of 2023, and he copied these events further as a means of baiting angry interactions on Twitter. Nothing substantial happened for a few months until the allegations were made public. During one of his attention-baiting episodes, Tumad mocks the death of a British trans girl named Brianna Gay by saying that she was his girlfriend. She was murdered, with the teenage pair who did it sentenced to life in prison for an exceptionally brutal killing, partly motivated by her transgender identity. I mean, there's just anyway, no benefit uh, to saying stuff like that. Like, I was, I was trying to tell him, I was like, dude, I know you're not a file, but like, there's just no reason to like tweet the picture of the trans 16 year old who's dead, like repeatedly be like, she's so sexy. Like, there's no benefit to that. Do you even think it's funny? Like, I can acknowledge like there's a funny aspect to folk to joking about something that's that up. Like, I, I, I almost get it. But it's like, just why? Like, why do that to yourself? You know the response you're going to get if, you, if, you're in, if you're in that position. And uh, right. he just seems to genuinely just not care. A lot of trans people on Twitter were upset about this, and with the hate swirling, a user named Goldie Bell took it as an opportunity to talk about her experience with Tumad. On June 24th, at 1.41 a.m., she posted saying the following, Tumad is psychotic. What he said about the trans girl is genuinely how he is IRL. He's way worse in real life. Most psychopathic person I've ever met. If you're reading this, Medea, this isn't an excuse to try talking about me again. I'm completely serious about involving the police. Spam from Tumad after I blocked him for SAing me. He made six burner numbers after this to also spam me on, as well as Instagram accounts and a Twitter account. If you want proof, I have all of it. Just ask. You can see him send texts actively at the end of this clip. Ah, uh, yeah, I met him October 2022. I hung out with him in person a few times. There's seriously so much insanely terrible stuff he did to me, it would take ages to explain, but the highlights is that he was taking a lot of drugs, pressured me into sex, verbally belittling me constantly, jokes about things like if I myself that it would be hot, that he would kill me and stuff, locked me outside his house in the middle of the night for fun. Then when he asked me to come over to apologize, he sexually assaulted me by groping me the whole time while I kept pushing his hands off, telling him no. Pressured me into sex again after I asked, does it matter if I don't want to? He said no, then grabbed me as I was trying to run out of his house's front door and started groping me while I was crying and had to use my full power to get him off. His friends showed up as I was running to my car and helped me get out after two mads started running to my car as I was about to go. Then that night he saw XQC and his girlfriend and told them both everything because he thought it was so funny. I didn't really say much, but yeah, the groping thing was nothing compared to what happened earlier. Basically, I was extremely uncomfortable in telling him to stop touching me. He kept grabbing my thighs and messing with my skirt, started like touching my feet and shit, and I'm literally stuck in a corner basically, and the MF stands up, takes out his dick, and kept telling me to grab it and look at it and stuff, and keep in mind, I'm super uncomfortable. I told him to put it away, and he kept getting closer to me doing same shit until I tried leaving the room. He grabbed me then, and like, he grabbed me from behind. He was still hard, and I could feel it against my back as I was trying to get away, and he was still like grabbing my stuff. Sorry for wall of text. Oops. He did that twice. At the time, Tumad responded by saying, okay, and call the cops, do it. They'll be like, who asked? Goldie Bell then posted a screenshot of Tumad supposedly mocking Bianca Devins, who is a 17-year-old girl who was brutally murdered by a guy she knew online. She also said she had more screenshots of him being a bad person compiled in a folder, but refused to reveal it for the time being. She then posted a video of him apologizing for misgivings, including making sexual advances she was uncomfortable with and pushing past her boundaries. I am, I am literally driving, but, um, uh, I'm, I'm literally in Oregon, fucking Washington, Oregon. Dab, yeah, okay, so, apology. Alright, so I can't take the damage away that I've done, but, uh, I'll, I'll try my best, okay? Okay, I, I at least want to take responsibility for what the f I did, you know? You know, the, like the way I treated you in like, at the very least, he seemed to admit some kind of wrongdoing, but what it was was unclear, as was the severity. She then posted literally thousands of messages of him spamming her, acting like a nut job, basically. Some people questioned if this was just typical too mad behavior, while others speculated he had to be using some substance to justify spamming someone this much. While he wasn't on YouTube, he was still infrequently streaming on Twitch. The same night Goldie Bell posted all of this, he went live and made fun of her, saying she was desperate for attention, and that the allegations were cookie cutter and dumb. Getting a real response out of him was nigh impossible. Nobody believes you. Okay, actually, it actually 
literally the first thing that I did. Was, I'm not that bad. I didn't fucking. <laughs> Bro, I was on the couch with the fucking cat scrolling. Welcome. Mindlessly. And then I saw the fucking kid. <laughs> oh my god, it was an honest mistake. I was just fucking posting. I was just doing. Sh I was just talking, okay? Like. Can, I don't tell you. In this stream, he also said she was his girlfriend at some point, and this was a relationship struggle. He also, in a few different contexts, claimed he had paid Goldie Bell for oral sex, which she supposedly accepted. Meanwhile, Goldie Bell said she was never in a relationship with him. There also seemed to be some conversation about him giving her money here. He says he wants to shower her in cash, they discuss some money that he's to give her to make her feel better for something he did, and then when they're talking about him giving her money, he says she should get the sperm out of him. Most f***ing ridiculous shit, okay, whatever. I don't like cats culture anyways so many fucking dudes that you guys stress on a day-to-day -day basis have done that same shit, if not worse it's common him downplaying the allegations by saying this kind of thing, whatever the truth was, and saying it happens all the time, definitely didn't help him in the eyes of the public. Now, at the same time, this clip looks especially bad when taken out of context. He does, however, outright deny any sexual misconduct ever took place. Some of it's false. Like, she's over-dramatizing it. Like, I didn't say this all, it just didn't happen. That never happened. That's her main headline, right? That's the main headline? Never happened. He also said she was mentally ill, which informed her supposed false allegations as she was abused in her youth. The truth is that she's she was it as a child right okay it happens all the time and that makes it so like this what happened to her is a lot worse in her fucking head finally he reflects that had he not started shit with the trans community on twitter this may have never come out and he would have been left alone you made this shit 10 times worse for yourself okay yeah if i wasn't doing that trend i don't know if she would have posted that the guard on uh, uh, twitter if i wasn't like wilding out originally this is like a train, like I'm just having a train ran on me. In response to the apology video, he claimed it was a coerced confession. Meanwhile, others leaked messages of him spamming people for no response. When questioned about his harassment, he told people to end their lives, spammed even more, complaining about how his personality doesn't make up for his physical appearance, and more schizo babble. It was clear by this point that he had some delusions of grandeur, believing himself to be a few notches above the average man. He was also constantly posting memes about light yagami from Death Note. I mentioned earlier how he was consistently using stimulants and also marijuana. While both of these can have negative effects, their toll on your body in the short term tends to be much less extreme than with hard stuff, which by this point in time he was very into. Introducing ketamine. A big aspect of ketamine is in fact delusions. Ketamine is a dissociative anesthetic that has some hallucinogenic effects, and the more you take, the more these effects take hold. This is a drug he has referenced tens of times, and so at the time, many assumed he was frequently under the influence of the powerful psychoactive drug, which was definitely impacting how he responded to everything. But with most situations like this, they never actually escape the Twitterverse. This time, it did, when Goldie Bell filed a civil suit against him. On July 6, 2023, Goldie Bell, real name Isabella, filed a request for a protection order against Tumad or Medea Sadiq. She claimed she was being harassed by him through threats, both public and private. She also said they've been witnessed by James Prime, the real life name of James Ski. She claimed it began in December of 2021 and lasted until the present. When asked if he had threatened her with a weapon, she said, Respondent pulled his gun on me while I was standing on his front porch, which was caught on video and posted to Tumad's Twitter account. He owns numerous firearms. In connection with his threats, she posted a video to Twitter showing him firing his pistol in the air while sitting on his patio. She also claimed to have been sexually assaulted on multiple occasions, including coerced oral sex and intercourse. I live in constant fear of my life. I am Isabella, and I am the petitioner in this action. I bring this petition because I fear for my life and safety. I am a 19-year-old art student. Beginning in November 2021, respondent Medea Sadiq sexually assaulted me on multiple occasions and over the last several weeks has made private and public threats to my life, repeatedly harassing me online and by phone. Respondent also pulled a gun on me, which is captured on video. Exhibit C. I believe that the respondent is severely mentally ill and unstable. I fear that he's going to harm me. I met respondent online in October 2021, shortly after I turned 18 years old. Respondent is a famous YouTube video creator with millions of subscribers and hundreds of thousands of followers on Twitter and other social media platforms. On or around November 21st, 2021, respondent invited me over to his house to spend time together. When I arrived at his door, he immediately asked me for my ID to verify that I was 18 years old. He then asked me to 
give him my phone, which I did. He then deleted our prior text message conversations on my phone and told me to leave. I immediately felt very uncomfortable and left after just 10 minutes. In December 2021, respondent manipulated me into coming back to his house to visit. He ensured me that he would not make any sexual advances towards me and that he simply wanted to apologize to me for how he had previously acted. He gave me marijuana and I quickly became intoxicated. He then returned to making advances. As we were watching a YouTube video together, he pulled out his penis and demanded that I give him oral sex. I was in shock and refused him over and over again. At that point, he placed himself between me and the door and began to get enraged. I knew he had multiple guns in the house and he was not going to let me leave. Because I was scared of what he would do to me if I continued to refuse his advances, I performed oral on him against my will. I was too intoxicated to drive home that night. His manipulation continued over the next several weeks and he exerted sexual control over me, eventually forcing me to have sex with him against my will. I repeatedly told him that I was not consenting to sexual relations with him and in an attempt to lure me back into his house again, he sent me a photograph of a contract he drafted wherein he promised not to demand sexual acts from me and he acknowledges his wild, uncontrollable psychological problems. A true and correct copy of the photograph is attached. By January of 2022, I had enough. I told the respondent that I would never allow him to touch me again. As I turned to run out of his house, he ran after me, tried to tackle me and grope my breasts. He seemed to find this funny. I was in tears and begging him to let me leave. When I finally got out of the front door, two of the respondent's friends happened to pull into the driveway. They saw my highly emotional state and asked me if I was okay. I told them I was not okay and his friends acknowledged that the respondent was known to act this way towards women. At the time, I did not go to the police for fear of him retaliating against me. Shortly thereafter, respondent sent me a video of him apologizing for assaulting me. The video will be provided to the court at the evidentiary hearing. Over the last several months, respondent has continuously harassed and stalked, making several threats to my safety. His threats and harassment have become more and more alarming over the past two weeks. In the past, he's shown up to my apartment unannounced and as recently as four days ago, under information and belief, he sent a package to my parents' address in Orange County. While I blocked his phone number, he set up eight burner phone numbers so that he could continue to spam me, contact me, and threaten me. The text and spam messages number in the thousands. In one unsolicited direct message, he threatened, school shooters are like tortured souls that fester in dark rooms with their misery. Is there a chance? Hmm, yeah. Like I might get a phone call from Jesus Christ to exhume your soul for the sacrifice, and unfortunately in this situation, I must do. Further, respondent repeatedly harasses and threatens me online, including on Twitter, which has provoked his large following of fans to join in the harassment. Just a few days ago, the respondent referred to me in a threatening tweet, watching Death Note to mentally prepare the most effective way to make this bitch jump out of her skin in her apartment. In another tweet while talking about me, the respondent posted a meme depicting three assault rifles with the caption, who's getting the assault rifle? He further tweeted that he will burn my life to the ground and that he is plotting on the bitch. In another tweet, he bragged about sexually assaulting me. What do you mean? I got a bunch of head and sex from her. I won, lol. He continued, well, actually, it's around 30 when our students become successful. They kind of die inside in the meantime. I'm gonna get away with this sh After being confronted online for essaying me, he tweeted to his hundreds of thousands of followers, you know what? I would do it again. In another tweet, he posted a video of two birds mating with the caption, so this is what I did to Bella, basically. Respondent continues to post photos of me in connection with threats to my safety. Examples of respondents online and telephone harassment are attached here too as Exhibit B. Further, respondent is in possession of multiple firearms and his online harassment makes reference to his firearms. In between his threatening tweets, respondent posted a video of him firing his gun off on his patio at his home. Respondent is known for flaunting his significant arsenal of weapons online, and he appears to have a fascination with firearms. On one occasion, the respondent pulled a gun on me while I was standing at his front door. The axe was photographed on his doorbell camera, and he posted the photo to his Twitter account. True and correct copies of respondent's gun-related activity are attached as Exhibit C, fearing for my life on or around June 26, 2023. I went to the Culver City Police Station and filed a police report, case number 233383. Officer Bo Railsbach suggested that I immediately hire counsel and seek a civil harassment restraining order. I am terrified that respondent is going to kill me and or continue to attempt to exert sexual control over me. Respondent appears to be severely mentally ill and unpredictable. The constant threats and harassment are ongoing and respondent has caused me substantial psychological and physical harm. His conduct has led to my extreme anxiety, depression, and habits of self-harm. All right, so with her main statement out of the way, let's get to the evidence. Exhibit A features a written apology that Tumat had signed saying he would agree to not demand sex from her. It was apparently a sleeper agent code word, which would make him be forced to admit how he was scaring Isabella and apologize for his actions. Past this point, most of the evidence regards Twitter posts and messages Medea made and sent to Goldie Bell. Exhibit B shows that Discord message of him saying school shooters are like tortured souls, but he has a life worth living. The next one shows him saying, is there a chance? Hmm, yeah, low key, I can lie and say no though, like I might get a phone call from Jesus Christ to exhume your soul for the sacrifice. And unfortunately in that situation, I must do it. Now some of the posts entered into evidence are just straight up goofy to be included here. This one shows him making some meme 
about Death Note. The next image is a Halo meme assigning the assault rifles featured throughout the series to their respective Alvin and the Chipmunks character. Page 16, meanwhile, shows Leafy is here asking Too Mad why his Riz is so bad, with him responding saying he got a bunch of head and sex from her, so he won. In the same screenshot, we see him saying the reason he made the apology was to get her to unblock him, and it was not sincere. They feature him spam posting about driving in Oregon, which was his favorite bit during this time. You guys don't get it. He's not giving a good response, not because he's crazy, but because he was driving. You're not supposed to text and drive, especially not in Oregon. Page 22 features a tweet of him saying, you want me to suffer for it? Hell nah. And you know what? I would do it again. The next page is a meme he made about Oregon and the allegations. Finally, at the end, we get some text messages of Too Mad and her. She asks him not to send her sexual things anymore, and he just dismisses her. Then there's a bunch of nonsense about self-improvement, and I miss the rage. Now for Exhibit C. The first piece of evidence here is an 11 second video Too Mad posted himself, which appears to feature Goldie Bell coming to his door and him holding a gun. She claims this is one of the moments when he threatened her with a firearm. Here is that video. Now in the video itself, Too Mad claims that this Glock is just an airsoft gun, but he does have a real one. The next video is a re-uploaded edit from Too Mad depicting him walking on his patio with a different airsoft gun, shooting it into the air with artificial muzzle flashes and sound effects. Look, whoever's the CEO of Web P, look at this shit. What the f This is not a PNG. This is some bullshit. <clears throat> what the fuck? They then show Google image search results for Too Mad Gun, and there are various images here. The one on the top right is obviously photoshopped. The one on the top left is a video where he uses an airsoft gun to kill a spider. It's on your leg! No! The one on the bottom right was confirmed by YouTuber Yumi to be an airsoft gun, and appears to possibly be the same one he shot on his patio. Finally, the photo of him with the Thompson also appears to be airsoft, but it's really difficult to be certain here. I'm not a gun expert. It's just uncomfy. Yeah, it is kind of unwieldy. And that's the end of the evidence for the initial suit. Now, the purpose of this suit, to be clear, is to secure a protection order for her so that the court orders Too Mad to stop contacting her altogether, which honestly is a valid motivation considering the fact that he was constantly going schizo on her and wouldn't stop contacting her. He incessantly posted about the situation after it all came out with vague memes and directly addressed her. In August of 2023, he called into the TBH podcast to respond to the allegations. I deny everything. Okay, I did some of that. Uh, so not everything. Which things? No, I didn't do sh Okay, I don't deny every time. I deny some things and I accept some things, okay? Thank you. I'm just describing what the f*** I'm asking you I'm in Oreo right now. <laughs> Too much? Are you still there? Uh, he left. Then he called into Augie RFC's live show while I was there to just spam a bunch of memes and really not say much of anything. Buddy. I have more marketable skills than you too. I'm a better editor. I'm literally, I mean, literally, if I didn't have a YouTube channel at all, I could work as a manager, work as an editor. No, you couldn't. And be where, like a Denny's? Dude, do you even know how to use Sunday? Do you know how to use Sunday? Dude, if there's anybody who's more likely to work at Denny's, it's fucking you, bro. Please stop coping. <laughs> Now, around this time, a lot of people had been making videos about what was going on. Myself, Oompaville, really any commentary channel was making a video about the two mad allegations. So he decided to start posting a series of responses, which are completely unwatchable garbage. Hey guys, welcome back to another video. Two mad is? Yeah, he's a legend. Yes, that's me. But if we're to summarize what he said here, he basically says, one, yes, I am a scumbag. Two, yes, I did try to and successfully paid her for sex. And I did also, three, spam her with messages. However, he does not believe this constitutes stalking and claims he didn't sexually assault her. He admits to being a manipulative weirdo, but not someone who has assaulted a girl. While I was reviewing these allegations on my own live stream with Gokunaru, Too Mad decided to call into the show to have a chat about everything. He joins the call, to which I immediately ask him why he has posted this ear suicide inducing unwashable response to which he claims it is watchable because other people have low production quality and still succeed. I, of course, rebuttal saying that this is an important video where he's responding to allegations and he just sort of acts dense and doesn't get it. It's unwatchable, Why? dude. I turned it off. It's not unwatchable. You turned Bro, it off. I shot myself I have to... in the throat after watching it. I have to watch furries, okay, like, people, have... Mike, there's that one streamer with the C920 mic that there's millions of views of J flat C920 videos. Like, this is like, it's ear. Yeah, but this is but supposed to be like a serious response. Uh, yeah, but yeah. why the f the thing is, is okay. So there's a okay. There's a balance to be struck with. Um. So you you were talking about oh this dude fell off, right? Okay. So it gets canceled, still fell off, right? Okay. So part of that is like okay, well you haven't posted anything interesting in a while. Yeah. And the other part of it is you just straight up aren't like you don't care, like unironically uncancelable. 
Gokunairu then makes the case to him that not caring what the internet thinks at all is dumb, especially with an ongoing lawsuit, which could result in financial damages to him. He doesn't seem to agree. Being beholden to the internet. You know, like, if you, if you give a f about what people think, you're beholden to them. Yeah, yeah. But, like, do you realize how that can, like, result in you going, like, off the f rails and smashing into a brick wall? Alright, what's the worst thing that I did? What's the most off the rails thing I did? I mean, you're being sued right now. Yeah. Oh, the being sued thing? I didn't do that to myself. I did that to myself a year and a half ago, but that was a year and a half ago. What do you mean did it Wait, to yourself as in, like, um, you did what she said? Like, or everything you're that, saying, like, what, I, yeah, what, what happened? I'm, yeah, what I'm being sued for, I did it a year and a half ago. Okay, but now well, your response always, to it is to, like, make this, like, insane video where you just, like, blow out the mic and say a bunch of bullshit babble and like scream like well like, okay well the, so the alternative is to say nothing yeah it's a lawsuit an ongoing lawsuit do you have to comment right now but if you say if you say nothing it's like then it's like i'm beholden to people couldn't you just make a statement and be like yeah i mean i'm just dealing with it right now like you know i'm gonna deal with it legally in the proper channel like i feel like there's there, there's literally no benefit to that video the first time that okay, whole that no that whole audience has heard of you is just like schizo unwatchable video it's like his mission at this moment seemed to be to completely just go off the rails publicly and piss off as many people as possible he didn't care about pleasing anyone in fact he wanted to rid his audience of the emily blm types as he puts it and just leave the based ones so to speak but given the serious situation he was in being in a lawsuit it didn't make sense to us why he would be posting things like i did it and i would do it again and to make all of these terrible response videos no matter what we said he didn't seem to get it yeah my prediction is like so basically the, the, basically it's literally what i said in the video which is just like she's traumatized by somebody else so she's like having an overreaction to what happened to her so like the the, the actual like intelligent opinion on like what actually happened is like pretty innocuous non-excessive but it's like it's 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 still not good just in the sense of like because she's traumatized it's like i should have been more delicate about it but what i did is like like she's definitely like he's gay like she's a little do you think that anything you've said on like Twitter or in the video was like admissible in court in any way? Yes. Do you think that would like? Bode, but the thing do you is, think that would bode well for you in court or no? They're trying their. They're gonna try their hardest to like paint this image, but I feel like that's what you do when you have way too much money. The thing is, it's like they're not gonna take the tweets and be like, "Ah, oh, yes, he's schizo." He's they might. I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean, I don't. I don't think that's yeah, what they say. They I think. I think they'd take it and be like, "Why is he like just saying all this bullshit?" contradicting himself like it doesn't really make sense yeah, yeah i mean yeah there's like the contradiction contradicting thing but like that's like also, a big it's just deal like, well not 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 it not as bad as it is because like it's gonna all get aggregated anyways right all together testify and then they're gonna look <laughs> at the tweets and stuff like that yeah i just uh, and then like just what are you doing has your lawyer told uh, you what if it's a good idea or not to post on social media i assume he said it's a bad idea yeah he told me not to but it's like i can just tell the guy is like not taking it too seriously like he's, he's an experienced lawyer so he's dealt with like a he's a, not taking it seriously like, i feel like he is taking it seriously well, no, he's, he's taking it seriously but he's not taking it seriously in the sense of like you need to stop doing that now it's more like you should stop doing it rather than you should stop doing it now like for example like killing somebody that would be like a thing that a lawyer would be like you need to stop doing that now <laughs> yeah you. during the stream we tried to convince him to just make a coherent response that was actually watchable we compared his case to those like quite where they managed to respond and debunk the allegations to the public he just didn't get it and delusionally believed that if quite had posted a 240p ear reaction video instead of his comprehensive debunking then he would have gotten off scot-free I mean, bro it, it you're, you're basically like... worried you're gonna undermine your swag when your swag's already like insanely undermined bro yeah. like the whole point of kind of like the quiet no, video is the guy the guy like took his mask off and he was like being candid right i mean yeah but he didn't need to do that he didn't need to show his face he didn't need to video but quite didn't need to show his face for the first time and just irreparably but yeah, but okay. The, the concession that he had to make was like, I've, I'm smart. a I'm a virgin fanatic. The concession Pirates of God to make is, <laughs> I'm a disgusting furry. Like I have all these <laughs> up things. I'm a <laughs> addict as well. But then he was like, well, I'm not That's a file, terrible. and like that was that is terrible. But it's Nobody like, but it's like that, that, that is that is file. terrible. But in the public opinion, I know. But in the public opinion, both of those people won. So wouldn't you just take some pointers? It also became clear during this interview that Tumad did not have much going on. He basically spent all day alone in his apartment, letting mold grow on his brain. She's trying to kill you by making these allegations. Is that what you're saying? I like, didn't say that. Me? No, I didn't say that. All right, all right. You said that. All right. <laughs> Tumad, what do you do uh, on a daily basis, brother? Jerk off. You're a hundred percent like mentally. You feel like you're fine, right? Like on every. Ironically. Uh, I guess I'm fine. Like, do you have best friends, bro? They're like offline. Mm, yeah. Wait, no, not not offline. Okay. Have you been like? Is there anyone like this? Like, been around you throughout this? Like, just kind of keep your head on straight or no? Uh, not really. I'm based. I see. Oh, well. You're making being based sound really depressing, bro. <laughs> what do you mean depressing? It builds character. Being alone? Uh, it can. Yes. Uh, I mean, absolutely. You don't think that builds fortitude? Having a hard life? No, I want a hard life. I've never wanted an easy life, but. 
but um, doesn't what mean you need to like experience it alone anyway. Yeah, um, I think having people around is really important. Well, there's 7 billion people, so eventually it's fine. Afterwards, we moved into the allegations themselves. Timed claims the nature of their meeting was prostitution. He said he messaged her asking her to give him oral for money, and she agreed, at which point their interactions in real life began. Like the never suck my dick ever, like without two, without 200 The 200 dollars was just like, oh, I, now I'm doing it. So she wouldn't give you head if not for the money, is that what you're saying? Yes. Okay. Just completely knocked open the door. It was like, I never do that. It was before that it was like, I never do that. And after that, she's like, okay, how big are you? Um, I think I'm gonna swallow. It's like, what the f it's a complete switch in the head. However, during their interactions, they developed actual feelings for each other and were hanging out pretty frequently, talking every day. I've had like a little girlfriend thing before too, but it's like, this was more than that. No, I get That's it. That's what I mean. Like, yeah, this is like your first time being like intimate with a chick, basically. So there was messages where you were saying like, not trying to date or whatever. Was that you kind of like trying to convince her you weren't trying to date because she didn't want to date? Like, I'm kind of confused how she's claiming you weren't dating and then you're, you're saying like you are. Like she didn't want to date, but like you were effectively dating. Is that kind of what it was i mean so there was like so okay for example she'll say like you chose me or like she'll say like i'm trying to lock down this dub or and or i'll say like oh we're gonna be friends if you don't have sex with me and then she'll be like oh that feels like sh stuff like this or it'll be like like it's just like it's just like i don't know what the what the, the distinction is like it's the only thing i know about like an intimate relationship with a woman it's like yeah the, it's like i've had little friendship things but it's like i've had like a little girlfriend thing before too but it's like this was more than that he considered it to be a relationship although keep in mind he had never had a girlfriend so it's hard to say what his understanding of that would be and this brings us to the night isabella describes in her lawsuit in isabella's version of events too mad wanted her to come into his home and told her he would not make any advances he then gave her weed and returned to making those advances she says as they are watching you YouTube, he pulled out his penis and demanded oral. She refused over and over again. Then he places himself in front of the door, becoming angry that she won't give in. She said she was scared because she knew he had multiple guns and was not going to let her leave. So she gives in. During the live stream, some of these interactions do seem to line up. According to him, she comes inside, they go upstairs, she sits down on his bed and calls him an incel. He starts touching her right away and making advances. She shoves his hands off. He does it again. She gives him a strange smile and shoves his hands off again. He advances again. She declines and says stop. And Tumad says that past that point, nothing happens. During the same night, though, he started touching her toes. And she says she's going to drive home if he keeps touching her. And according to Tumad, this is where the interaction ends. I'll also let him speak for himself here so you can hear exactly what he said. This time with the gun was the second time you met her. Um, what goes down then? Uh, I don't know if it was the second time. It probably wasn't. Uh, but uh, yeah, she comes inside uh, and then we go upstairs. This is me telling you exactly like, what happened with this girl. Yeah. I feel like it's like the first time I did this. Okay. So I remember that we went upstairs. She sat down here and just complaining about, oh, you tell me to cut myself. You don't like women. You're like an incel. Blah, 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 blah. She's always complaining about some stupid shit. Um, and then I, so I start touching her, like, I sit in front of her, she's sitting in a chair, right, so I'm sitting on the floor, and I just start, like, I'm trying to make advances, right, so I'm, like, touching her thigh, and then, what she, what she originally, she didn't care the first time, and she eventually was, like, she looks at me, and she shoves my hands off, okay, and then she does that, like, again, with that loop happens where I put my hand on her thigh, not really, like, grasping or anything, I would just put it on top of her thigh, and then, uh, she, like, gives me this she looks at me again she gives me like a like a, a smile like it's like a weird smile uh, and she shoves my hand off again so like that's like the third time or something like that and the fourth time she was like stop and then i stopped when she said stop i stop and then like some little while later i start touching her toes and then she's like you have like a foot fetish and i'm like no and then, then she eventually gets to like i'm, I'm gonna want to drive home if you keep touching me i'm clearly not happy says that and then she says i like pulled my dick out or whatever the fuck. it's like i don't remember this but after after the toast thing and she starts complaining like I want to drive home or whatever I, I'm pretty sure I just like that was kind of the end of the it doesn't really go. Was this the same interaction that she claimed was like um, a sexual experience, or was this just your first time meeting her in person, like the sexual assault or whatever happened? Because there's a moment where she's like, she, you, she, she's like, she claimed that you like shoved her, pushed her down, tried to make her do stuff. Whoa, whoa, whoa wait, what? When did she say that? Didn't I see this a oh, while ago? Wow. Wait, when? She was, she, was claiming there was, she was claiming there was sexual like assault, like it was like an assault. Yeah, no, she's using the word sexual assault for sure. But when did she say like? Uh, I can't well, remember. You're saying. I mean, maybe I'm misremembering, but I thought I saw that on Twitter. Well, she I, says like tackle in the. In the TRO, she says, like, he tried to tackle me. He got enraged, blocked the door. Okay, maybe that's what I'm uh, thinking of. Yeah, maybe that's what I'm thinking of, sure. Yeah, there's definitely no shoving. Like, I, I wouldn't be surprised if she claimed it, but I didn't actually do that. But she says that I blocked the door. Okay. And then I made it so she couldn't leave, or she knew that she couldn't leave. Did you do that so or When not? she gets in the courtroom, blocking the door? Dude, okay. She said that I trapped her in a 
corner or some shit like that, okay? I know what corner that was. She was sitting in a chair. This girl, you have to understand, we've already had a, like a, a many incidents where it's just like I, the same routine where I'm just like, hey, are you gonna suck my dick one day or what? And she's like, no. And then it's, just, and then and then she's like, I'm gonna leave. And then she leaves, and then she comes back, and she leaves, and then she comes back. And I walk her outside, and she leaves, and then she comes back. Like we've already done this a million times. If she wanted to leave, she could leave just like the other time. But because I was touching her, that's why her brain becomes like, oh, I'm stuck here. I can't leave. But the truth is, if she stood up and decided to just like, you know, I don't know, go to the washroom or something, I would have just been like it wouldn't i wouldn't even notice so there's there there's no never been a scenario in which you've been like you can't leave right now you have to stay <laughs> absolutely the not. Now, these are two very different interpretations of that night. He says he doesn't even remember his dick leaving his pants. It's worth noting that at this point, he was already heavy into drug use, so it's possible his interpretation of events is affected by that use. So, were there ever times when you would take ketamine and you just pass the f*** out and you don't even, like, remember? You get, like, a, a ketamine blackout? Yeah. Okay. Would you basically, nice. like, use the ketamine kind of as a crutch to, uh, like, you know, make you feel, like, more, you know, base level when you would, like, get... Yeah, it would, I used it to talk to girls, yeah. Yeah, no, I to talk to the girls, yeah, but like I'm saying like to literally like uh you know like when you would basically make like sexual advances and shit like that would you usually not really no no, no not okay. like that like I, I would I'm use saying, ketamine like, not because I was like say again? like earlier in the day like would you yeah like earlier in the day like I would I, was, I would use ketamine like he also said he absolutely offered her weed that night I, I definitely offered her marijuana that day I know that because I have a video of me when I sexually assaulted her she claims or whatever speaking of weed this is an underexplored aspect of too mad in the past he'd been known to use it and other drugs excessively showing this was not the first time a problem presented itself. You're about to lay down? Yeah. Yeah, because he fucking has that weed vape and hit like 40 fucking hits off it <laughs> since we started the podcast. Yeah. It's likely that for a lot of his career, the guy was using something. And on the same stream, he also says he definitely pressured her into sex. But in his view, she could have left at any point in time and he never would have stopped her. From your perspective, it's all going to get thrown out because of the sexual assault stuff just being unprovable. It's, it's possible. The, the sexual assault stuff, I really just don't. Like, I was literally Googling it earlier today. I still think about it all the time. Is what I did sexual assault? It says coerced sexual assault, right? Yeah. Coercion. The thing is, I definitely pressured her, right? I absolutely did. Since day one, it was just like the same question. Like, it wasn't like I sprung on her. It was just the same question. Every time we pressured out, her to give you a head, she would right? Come, yeah. When she comes over and when she leaves, it's just like I would and ask for the same thing over and over and over and over. So I think when, so, when someone when someone hears like pressure, like Chas going crazy right now, they hear like you you there was some level of like trying to force her like or like be like you need to do this right now. Yeah. I mean I mean you you were asking her repeatedly. Was there? Do you think that you went over the line in terms of like any any level of consent and any of those interactions? So here's what here's what pushed her into it. When when she had sex with me, I remember that when all I had to do was ask. So I don't know I don't know I mean, that was easier. I feel like all I had to do was like keep asking asking her over and over. She eventually was like. Like, okay, we in, in the week, one of my periods over, we can have sex. So that was a dub, which then she claims a sexual assault. We agreed to it days before. What the f you're saying you did not force her, you just asked her, and then eventually, like, if she wanted out of that interaction, she could have left at any point in time, but she yeah, did, she, she stayed, yeah, she absolutely, and eventually yeah. she agreed right. to have sex with you. Like, you weren't keeping her in a house or anything, right? Yeah, she says that I used guns, I had guns. Okay, so what she says, I have guns, she knew that I had guns in the house, and yeah. that I she knew that she I wouldn't let her leave. What the f why would I stop you from leaving for the first time? This is a repeat of every night we ever hung out where you come and go. I'm like a f***ing virgin. It's not like I know what I'm doing. I don't know how to secure sex. If I knew how to get sex from girls, I would have I would have done that. It's not that. It's just like my way of getting sex is literally just asking him, can, I'm deep, can I please cunnilingus? Can I please? Like, Zemo Nitro says he words. nagged his way into sex, douchey move, but not sexual assault. I mean, that's what it sounds like from his perspective. Like he just asked her enough and eventually she said yes. Like as far as, as yes. far as pressuring, I think when people hear pressuring, they think like you were like, you need to do this right now or I'm going to but here's the thing. You're saying you didn't was say there, that. Yeah, okay, there definitely, it wasn't killing. But it, it was just was, like, there wasn't, were you just like begging her? Is that what it was? Like, like please have sex with me. It was me. begging. There was the begging. There was always begging, but there was an ultimatum. Like, when she when she had sex with me, it was just begging. When she sucked my balls the day, like, I sexually assaulted her, she claimed, uh, there, I gave her an ultimatum. And the ultimatum that was ultimatum. like, you either suck me off or I'm going to stop hanging out with you? Yeah, it wasn't even stop hanging out with you. It was just like, we can be friends. And then a fucking switch in her brain flip, and she started walking towards my... my Better. In the court documents, Goldie Bell cites an apology to Mad made as evidence of his crime, an admission basically. She also posted this original video on Twitter for everyone to see. Now, Too Mad claims this apology was disingenuous and merely a way for him to continue talking to her. He also claims the person in question who wrote the apology for him to say to her had his own allegations and as a result was an unreliable narrator. I do have a legit question though. There was that um one guy you brought up in the response to Oompaville that had to the 15 year old or whatever, allegedly. Hey. Um, <laughs> 
<laughs> Sorry. Um, do you have like, is there any evidence that he's the one that wrote all that? Like the apology? Did he write oh, it? Yeah. Out? Like, yeah, yeah, no. It's just like he sends me a text message. He's like, rewrite it so she doesn't know. Like, yeah. Oh, okay. So that's I don't, I don't really mention that a lot. Like, so that's she, that's a disregard for truth, right? She knows that it's not a true apology. She puts it on the internet. That, that also is a defamation case. She knew that? Yes, yeah, she knew that. I'm, um, I'm not gonna... Basically, there was this, uh, this situation where you were, you know, the whole driving in Oregon meme comes from you're driving, reading the apology. You claim that apology was written by someone who later turned out to be some kind of like creep himself. Like, what is your? I guess I was curious if you could go deeper on that, like who that person is. That guy, he was an opportunist that he found, he saw the opportunity of my. At the, so she has roommates, right? He's like an opportunist. He wants. To, he saw it as a chance to get with girls. That guy. Yeah. Who, yeah. Who the is that guy? Who is that guy? Just some kid who had a DJ career that got destroyed when everybody found out that he was having sex with a 15 year old. How old was he? You didn't know. He was 19. You didn't know that, like, while you were hanging out? No, I, no, I did know that. I meant, at some point, somebody told me that, and I was like, that's weird, and I just kind of ignored it. <laughs> Okay. You just um, kept hanging out with a guy? Not really. I didn't, I didn't hang out with the guy very often. You gotta understand. Uh, he's like, just a guy you knew? Okay. I, I've met him like three, four times, like something like that. Yeah, it's just like, a, well, the thing is, I don't have friends IRL. I saw him as many times as I saw Bella, you know what I mean? Like, that's like one of the closest people I knew in here in LA. In yeah. How many times you see Bella, though? Like, roughly? Like, four or five times, something like that. Less than 10. Did you end up seeing her after the Oregon apology? Um, I don't think so. Okay. Um, and then you texted her apologizing, like, more meaning, like, actually meaning it afterward, right? Yeah. Okay, and what, so when you actually felt like you were, you meant the apology, what were you apologizing for? Uh, plenty of stuff. I was saying, like, all types of things, like, the psycho psychopath, sociopath, doing drugs. Because you're whatever. saying now that she was saying you... In, uh, whatever, essayed her while you're in the relationship. Um, so now I'm trying to understand, like, what were you apologizing for? Were you, like, doing, like, a lip service apology for the essay stuff, even though you didn't mean it? Or, oh, like... yeah. One part of it is that, uh, well, I want her to forgive me. That's one. So that meant buying into her delusions so I could, like, get her to forgive me, right? Um, and then the, the other thing is, like, I don't know if I meant it in the sense of, like, I obviously I treated like a bad boyfriend. I don't know if I meant it as, like, a sincere apology. It's the most sincere one that I've given her, but it's, like, it was mainly because I wanted a girl back, right? One thing they don't disagree on is the obsession he had with her. Goldie Bell claims she was harassed and stalked by Too Mad, which is part of why she needed the protective order against him. He would use alternate phone numbers to message her a bunch of nonsense, spamming I Miss the Rage, which is a Playboy Cardi song famously covered by Mario Judah, over and over and over and over. He sent her the Easter Island emoji hundreds of times. He said Donda about a thousand times. And he also sent her messages trying desperately to convince her to speak to him again. I know there is nothing I can do to take away the damage that I have done to you, but at the very least I want to take responsibility. The way that I treated you and viewed you was not okay. I pushed past your boundaries for only the benefit of myself. I made sexual advances that you were clearly not comfortable with, and I chose to ignore it. I regret all of that so much. As for the kind of jokes that I made, it was never my intention to make you fear for your safety, but I understand now that's how I made you feel. I am sorry. As if this was all not enough for you, I acted very obsessive after I realized you had left. I am working hard in therapy to correct the parts of my brain that allowed me to act like this, and I'm going to make damn sure I never repeat these actions to anyone else. Enjoy love, I'm good. In these messages, it's clear he knows he did something to her, but doesn't really specify. Regardless, he continued messaging her for weeks. When you were spamming her fucking messages, okay, what, what yeah. time was that? Like, at what point in your fucking relationship was, you know what I mean? I did that all the time, but I don't, I don't know. Why did you do that? Were you just know. like desperate for her attention or? Sure. Like you were in love type of thing, but like, like, uh. I, yeah, I get, oh yeah, no, I was completely infatuated with this girl. That's why I also say like, oh, you're like dating or whatever the f because, I don't know, man, like, it's very invested. I, 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 that's the word I, was, I need to use. Yeah. Very invested. Very they're, invested. They're not, People like, like, I guess it's like you were invested. I just feel like, I don't know. There must have been other girls you could talk to. You're, like, famous. No. No. There's no girl that was nearly as invested in this girl. So it was just a fixation on her in particular, I see. I mean, I, I mean, like, people don't want to use the word dating, but it's like, bro, yeah, invested. I had large stonks. All, was SP she invested? 500. Yeah, I think so, yeah. There are a lot of other interesting pieces of information from this stream that iron out some of the details the public has been confused on, at least from Tumaz's perspective. One thing he says was that during the sexual encounters he had with Goldie Bell, he actually didn't even enjoy it, but he claims that she did. Is there any point where, uh, like, uh, <laughs> while you were or you know doing whatever that, that she switched so over gross. that no when we were having sex it was like i don't know she said when she didn't tell me like like after we had sex i was just completely like grossed out and like i don't want to do that again i was like i need to take a shower and then she was just kind of like whatever she was like 
laying down on the bed, like face down. And then like later on, she was like, well, I enjoyed myself. And then I just sort of said nothing. I was like, I didn't want to tell her like I hated it or whatever, but she was, but she was like, uh, yeah, she Sorry, said that she, she enjoyed said it. She enjoyed herself. Is that what you just said? Yeah. Yeah. She said she enjoyed herself. Okay. She said, I enjoyed myself because well, I was giving her signals that I didn't like you. Keep in mind, Tumad was also a virgin before he met her. And here he is saying all of his times having sex weren't even enjoyable. After this stream, I got added to a group chat with other drama channels to talk about the allegations. A bunch of people were in there, and for the time I was there, it consisted of everyone trying to convince him to take the allegations seriously and make a proper response because his goofy, aloof attitude towards it all was making him look guilty by default. He was also working on a WordPress website at some point to prove his innocence, but I don't think that was ever finished. Meanwhile, his tweets were as schizophrenic as ever. Too mad will remember this. Guys, you can't make edgy jokes. Freedom of expression is Jover, demonetized, demonetized. Kind of having everything happen all at once. Maybe it's ADHD. I don't know. I think I need a new lawyer. In any case, I won't kill myself or whatever, but I will lose faith in humanity forever if I don't get vindicated. Bowling noises intensify. Lord knows the community is itching for some drama to get knee deep into. This might be compelling. He was basically begging for someone to make a video debunking the allegations for him so he would be off the hook. He asked me for as much in DMs multiple times. He also asked me to loan him like $40,000 to pay for his lawyer, which he said he would then pay back tenfold if he won through making more videos. Gotta say, not the most enticing offer. Ultimately, Goldie Bell's restraining order was granted. Too mad was to not contact her for three years. Whatever the truth of what happened between them, he had no formal criminal charges and was a free man. Many expected him to turn a new leaf and get back to making the content everyone loved from him. Why wouldn't he? Unfortunately, that just didn't happen. Instead, his brain began to... Too Mad continued to schizophrenically post into the void on Twitter every single day. Sometimes he would deny any wrongdoing related to Goldie Bell. Sometimes he would claim he did assault her and he would do it again. Part of this can be chalked up to his mental illness, which J-Reg claims is schizophrenia or autism, and part of it is because he was doing drugs. A lot. Too Mad had already admitted to using ketamine multiple times, admitting he didn't even know how much he was taking and would just snort it indiscriminately. During a stream with Kanklemore, he also said he was taking Xanax. This Xanax was not prescription. Not only was it not his own, it wasn't a prescription at all. It was a Mexican-made version called Pharmapram. This version of the drug is often made with fentanyl due to its cheapness when compared to the actual compounds to make proper American Xanax. Even in small doses, this can prove deadly. Fentanyl has become such an epidemic that country artist Jelly Roll recently addressed the United States Congress about the epidemic of overdoses related to the drug. Tumad was taking Pharmapram regularly, and on a live stream with Kanklemore, he said he'd taken many of them at once. There's a lot of different things I've heard about Xan today, and I'm like, am I gonna die if you're taking 20 yeah you're gonna die okay i won't okay i won't take 20. yeah probably don't even take five if you take pro like the way you said you blacked out oh, half a one if you take three you're gonna die i took five already today yeah really not real like i would just keep popping them in and then i'd wait a little bit pop it in and then wait a little bit pop it in do you know what i mean yeah and then i would do two at a time while in this drugged out state, he even said something that some have taken as a full on admission to the Goldie Bell situation. Even in the recording with, where I was like, being that girl, it's like you can tell this has got his head on straight. Like, yeah, he's doing irreparable, reprehensible shit. He is sane. With all of this combined, it's hard to take Tumed at his word for almost anything. To put it scientifically, he's fried, he's cooked even. He seemed to be sinking deeper and deeper into this activity, spending his days rotting inside of his bedroom and getting high, and appearing on live streams to talk about all of his struggles. You haven't wanted for to keep a good relationship with people? Yeah, for like years, man. It's like chronic. Why do you think that is? Uh, that's the thing. I've been asking myself that question for a long time. All I can tell you is like, it's just been a lifelong struggle and it's just, there's a lot of different things you can try, but really it, it comes down to like the motivation. The person needs to do it. And then when he does do that, you might stop resenting all these normal people and you might be happy and fulfilled. Maybe. Or not, maybe, or not, or do more drugs until you die. I mean, I've uh, I've been there. Yeah, have you been there? Yeah, I've been clean from heroin for six years. That's why you're so chill, bro. I'm just kidding. <laughs> you're probably right, dude. You're probably right. I've been just smoking whatever the fuck I'm given. I can barely walk. Holy. 
It's hard. What'd you do? Xanax. Oh, oh shit. I used to have a little bit of a... I went on a bender in Xanax once. I think that's what I'm, I'm going to start going into soon. A uh, Xanny bender? Yes. That's the worst kind of bender. Why? Uh, okay, so... If you get addicted to Xanax and you want to get off of it, it'll f***ing kill you. Well, I don't think I'm going to get addicted. Yeah, I didn't either. Okay, that's terrible news. He was sinking further into his addiction to the point where he would take anything. Weed, Adderall, Xanax, ketamine, meth even. All of this was supposedly a part of his regular waking diet. He couldn't even walk, sometimes he was so deep in it. This is an extremely hard thing to pull yourself out of. In late January of 2024, it seemed things may be getting better. He messaged Kanklemore saying he was actually sober. This news didn't last very long. Within days, he was posting videos on Instagram of his ramblings, describing his life in no uncertain terms. Okay, so it's like this, right? You have three lawsuits and then you're like 22 year old. You were old, you smoke ketamine meth combination. And then what was the thing like? <laughs> what was the thing in the beginning? <laughs> oh, sorry, don't, don't chill, but I make loud noise, motherfucker. No, no, chill. Okay, wait, go back to the thing I was gonna say. What was I gonna say? What the fuck? Dude, bro, I haven't had good, no, I didn't say that. No, it's a bar though, say it, dude. No, I'm not gonna say it. No, I'm not gonna say it. What was I gonna say originally? On his Discord server, he was streaming his activities to his mods while tripping out. What the f*** is going on with this nigga, dog? What the f*** is going on with this nigga? Why is he taping his f***ing arm? This nigga think he in Dead Island. What the f*** weapon is he making? <laughs> what is he gonna do with that dongo? His final live stream was on February 8th, 2024, and featured him once again spamming gibberish to his audience. Many believe the following video is him foreshadowing his own passing. It's the question you cannot answer ever! <laughs> Why did I kill my- No, just, no, don't say that. Say it! <laughs> <laughs> say it! Stop the internal conflict and say it! Sorry, I don't mean to yell. It's fuck, they hear me, they're my neighbor. On February 14th, 2024, TMZ reported that Tumat had died of a possible overdose. The internet erupted at the news. On Twitter, there was a celebration. Hundreds of thousands of people cheered on his death. Many of them were unaware of the details of the allegations, and instead cheered it on because he was racist and transphobic. Those that did know about the allegations mostly expressed confusion. On YouTube, fans expressed disappointment in comment sections. They took to the most memorable videos and podcast appearances to mourn the death of a talented creator. Somebody that we, uh, we did like two Mads content together, like we did a stream with him, they got cited in his court case. No, two Mad is dead. No. Yes. Whoa. The cops found his body. He's, he's dead. TMZ, oh TMZ just reported God. it. He's fucking gone. Oh my fucking God. This is not like a joke, I'm not pranking you. Like he like he he, he killed himself. He overdosed. Holy Law enforcement sources tell us the internet personality was found unresponsive Tuesday night in his Los Angeles area home. It was after somebody called in to ask for a welfare check. He hadn't been heard from for a few days by concerned parties, and he missed some appointments. As a result, the cops were sent to check on him, and that's when they found the body. Well, it's unclear how long he'd been in that state. Our, our sources say there was drug paraphernalia found on the scene. I talked to this guy one day ago. One day ago I talked to this dude. What do you mean? What was the context? He just messaged me. He said, uh, he said, am I a genius on the 9th? And I said, yes. He said, why in layman terms? I said, you're really funny and made good videos. And he didn't respond. I was planning on doing a video about him soon with an interview. Like a post lost his interview because he didn't lose it, but he just killed himself. Yeah. Uh, he, he straight up died. Whatever, I don't know. I can't really, I don't know what the f to do. Like, I just gotta basically just not think about it for a bit, I guess, but, yeah. No, yeah, I mean, I have nothing to say. Like, I, I don't even know what I'm supposed to say about it. It hasn't really hit. Yeah. Yeah, are you, do you think you'll make a video on Tom Tark, or, uh, you think let that be, or what's your, uh... Maybe, a, maybe in a week or two. I'm traveling anyway, so I really can't right now, but... Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah. Okay. All right. Anyway. All right. Whatever. Uh, safe travels, bro. Yeah. Thanks, man. You too. Take it easy. Yeah. 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 I will. Bye. <sighs> Holy shit. I fucking knew this. I fucking know. No, knew this guy. He died last night when we were like partying in Mardi Gras or whatever, hanging out with BG Cumby. That is fucking crazy. It was clear that his final days were not peaceful, but to this day, we don't technically know how he died. According to TMZ, they were told by the police that it was a possible overdose, which is a reasonable assumption, but we don't really know. His Twitter, effectively his diary, was marked with incoherent nonsense during all of February 8th. His last tweet ever was just two words, Neutron Star. It'd been a while since we worked with him because of the spiral he went down and the sh that came out. It's not like we were actively still working with him through all of that. He used to say a lot of terrible sh to like Matt. It, it was a spiral that started pretty much out of nowhere. So most likely drug related and it completely destroyed him as a human being. No, I hadn't talked to him in quite a while. After the stuff he was saying like to Matt, it was very clear. He was not the same person that I, like, played games with back in, like, 2018, whenever that was, with, like, Rainbow Six. He had completely lost himself, so I hadn't talked to him in a while. He did message me, like, whenever TwitchCon was, seeing if I could give him a pass because he needed to do something there. Which, in retrospect to some of the things people were claiming, is really kind of chilling. I didn't answer, but that was... Looking at, like, having that and then seeing what people were saying about what he was trying to do at TwitchCon is really, really weird now. It's a really f situation. It really is. Like, I've, I've seen so many people say so much bad shit about him. I'll be honest, from personal experience, uh, he was an asshole to me as well. He tried to poach one of my editors from me. And that's pretty normal in the YouTube scene, like, editors getting taken on by other YouTubers. But he went behind my back and then reached out to uh, one of my editors and he said, you know, whatever whatever Pyro is paying you, I'll pay you double. He was really unapologetic and he basically just blamed it on his ADHD. And then like a couple of days later, he deleted his entire Discord account, almost as if to kind of like hide the, the evidence. So I've had bad experiences with him. But that being said, as much as I see everyone dunking on him on Twitter, for like horrible stuff that he's done. That's still someone that's incredibly young that died by 23. And also on top of that, that's someone who's, that's a situation where someone's parents have outlived their child, which I think is just, it's, it's fucking horrible. Apparently he passed away. That's really fucking sad, man. That's 23 years old. I mean, that's actually really, really, that's, that's legit sad, dude. What contributed to his mental state, in my opinion, is that he constantly wanted to up the ante and went from like troll to being a genuinely weird guy who also was definitely doing a bunch of sh behind the scenes, according to other witnesses and, and victims as well. And there is a sense of desperation that people feel when they feel like their their uh, time in the spotlight is waning. And then they lean into the worst tendencies and like uh, try to grab on. It's like you're in a state of free fall and you're trying to grab on to anything and everything you can in that state of free fall. There are always contributing factors to people behaving in the ways that they do. It's not an excuse at all for their actions. I'm not a defender of too mad at all. As a matter of fact, I did not like him at all. He was consistently harassing me routinely. In a perfect world, however, he should have been institutionalized. That's what should have happened. When the controversy around him began, he told me his father had started smoking again after a long time of having quit because the dad was so stressed about seeing his son appear in YouTube drama thumbnail. I don't think he deserves to be dead. That's my hot take for today. My hot take about a corpse. I do really feel right now, at least like the internet killed too mad, gave an awkward teenage boy, a false sense of being understood and a false sense of purpose. It gave him opportunities and social and financial power, all of which he abused at some point. And it encouraged him to lean into his eccentricities until the person he was offline and the person he was online were no longer distinguishable. It hollowed out his mind to the point where his video responding to the allegations about him, he was complaining that it didn't get enough views on youtube.com. It gave him an endless stream of stimulation that allowed him to stay atomized and alone and 
content in his room, and then it provided him the pathways to drugs which ultimately killed him. I can, here, rattle off the same platitudes that I've been rattling off on this channel for years. Have homies, have love, don't spend 14 hours a day on the computer. Don't think you're too good to know people, don't think you're too good to love people. Don't become too warped into the character you play online. I don't think Too Mad knew how to be a real person. I don't think he ever had to learn. The only thing I really do want to say is, uh, over the last few years, I've started talking to more and more people who are strange in some way, uh, autistic or schizophrenic or something. And um, when I talk to them and when I listen to them, what really stands out is how grateful they are that someone is taking the time to understand them beyond just viewing them as a nuisance. And I don't think being a nuisance on the internet warrants a death sentence and I don't think that is a good enough excuse to celebrate someone's death. I don't know how he would have wanted to have been remembered. He was a deeply nihilistic person, and I don't think he believed in anything besides himself. It's ultimately up to you as to what you think the lesson here is, if there's any lesson at all. And because I don't have a conclusion, I also don't know how to end this video, so... Baba Booey. Belle Delphine posted her own statement, saying, After talking online for around a year, Tumad flew all the way out to the UK to film a video with me, and we spent two days together. Over those two days, he was friendly, funny, playful, and a lot more shy than I expected. We were almost the same age, both enjoyed making random sh** on the internet, so I related with him a lot. I know lots of people who were hurt by him, and it's not all magically washed away, but serious substance abuse can bring out the worst in some people, changing them in ways that are unrecognizable. He created a cycle, where the deranged and erratic efforts of drug abuse led him to isolation which in turn exacerbates the substance abuse. It was so sad to watch all of this unfold. My old best friend who actually introduced me to Tumad also died from drug abuse in the exact same way, which has made me feel even more heartbroken about the situation. Both of my last interactions with them were nearly identical. I'm really sad that he's gone without ever knowing what life could have been like for him without his drug problem, or to have even lived to the age to be able to self-reflect on his insanely unique adolescence he had growing up on the internet. I found his content hilarious and admired how confident he seemed in his videos. He was so creative and often shared ideas with me and we'd both laugh about them. He really created his own genre of YouTube videos, doing it all while so young. He inspired me a lot, and I will miss him. Those with more negative experiences also posted, but not exactly in celebration of his passing. As of his death, Goldie Bell posted the following, saying, I don't know how to process the news of Medea's passing. It's a lot all at once, and I have conflicting emotions. He was a terrible, terrible person, and people tried to help teach him how to properly dose his drugs because they knew he would do it anyway, but he would do the opposite to get a reaction from them. He took it too far before, and he took it too far this time. I don't feel relieved because I don't know what will happen from here. I'm nervous about the internet's impending reaction as I already see it's trending on Twitter. I'm not happy he's dead. I'm not sad. I'm shocked and I can't feel anything but dread. I feel terrible for his family. Shortly after this, Goldie Bell deactivated her account. His former video editor posted his own statement as well. The last few days have been very difficult for me. I first started editing for Too Mad at the start of 2021 and although I had no real skill at the time, he was extremely patient and helpful with me. He allowed me to grow my skills over time while working with him. He made it clear that he believed in me. I was very excited around this time as I'd been a huge fan of him and his editing. It felt like a dream come true. Eventually, I would completely take over the editing of both the Too Mad and Too Mad 360 channels. I worked full time until the beginning of 2023. In the time leading up to when I had quit working for him, Too Mad had become heavily addicted to ketamine and DMT, and it became increasingly difficult to communicate with him. I found it extremely challenging to create any narrative with whatever footage he would send me. It also became clear that he no longer had the same drive to create videos, and I decided it'd be best for me to find another client which he understood, albeit with disappointment. I tried my best to consistently communicate with him after this and keep him company as best I could, as I understood he did not have many people to talk to and was worried what he might be doing left alone for too long. He told me that he was seeking therapy and was working on bettering himself. I found this very difficult to believe, as I don't think he even knew what that would entail. Over time, my frustrations with him grew, and I eventually found it impossible to talk to him. I now understand that many other people have had the same experience. Something I would like people to understand is that no matter what the subject matter was or what it was you were trying to bring to his attention, Tumad would only ever respond to you in a cryptic, meme-like speech, which you would then have to interpolate into something understandable. This was the case with work assignments, personal stories, basic questions or requests, etc. The crazy, unintelligible personality you watched escalate over time in his videos is exactly who he was in his personal life. This is what made it so hard for anybody to try and help him with his addiction and any other troubles, as not only could he not listen, he would derail anything you were trying to say into a nonsensical mess. This ability to communicate only became worse as his drug abuse became 
became more constant, ultimately resulting in a completely different Tomb Head to the one I had first been a fan of and eventually became friends with. A crazy and erratic personality, yes, but ultimately a talented, funny, creatively ambitious, and at times deeply insightful person. The response to Tomb Head's death has been equal parts upsetting and unsurprising. I will not defend him from anyone he harmed through personal attacks and emotional abuse. His behavior towards women in the space I find particularly disgusting. I did not find his incessant edgy trolling within the past year funny or acceptable, although his passing pains me personally to those who are hurt by him and find relief that he is gone. I understand you. I can only imagine what it was like to be on the receiving end of constant harassment from someone as cynically relentless as he was. I am, however, emotionally torn. Watching him project his mental deterioration in real time over Twitter in the past year has been very unsettling to me. Knowing his self-destructive behavior was a result of desocialization, drug abuse, and an inability to understand and communicate with the people who wanted to see him on the correct path. I, like many others, spent countless hours trying to help him get his life in order, trying to explain to him why his behavior could only end in disaster, but to no avail. I cannot stress exactly how far gone he was towards the end. He would frequently send me several screen-long rants about the discoveries or theories he had come up with through psychedelic trips, which could result in the transformation of our world, giving examples of physics equations and anecdotes from famous scientists like Einstein to back his points. He had become manic and had severe delusions of grandeur. I wish there was a way he could have gotten the help he needed. I wish he didn't handle loneliness and confusion with drug abuse. I wish he didn't treat people the way he did while having so much potential and wasted talent. I wanted more than anything for him to text me out of the blue one day with a positive, coherent plan of what he wanted to do with himself next. I hope that his family finds peace, and I hope people can take some sort of lesson away from all of this. Rest in peace, brother. This is where many expected the story to end. Ten minutes after the announcement of his death, a familiar face popped up. I can finally say it. Tumad was a rapist and a pedophile. Over the past few years, he tried to murder me multiple times for helping the police and detectives in multiple states to investigate a lot of horrible things he's done. He wanted to take out multiple innocent lives by getting behind a wheel and going head-on on a freeway while being high on drugs. He didn't succeed once as he overdosed before killing anybody, so he tried it again. Despite him trying to murder me and multiple innocent lives, I've been trying to help law enforcement to make sure he's safe, doesn't get hurt, and doesn't harm anybody. From this, there were a few corroborating tests testimonies. Robert Ross posted about what happened at TwitchCon. This is a lot. I witnessed firsthand Tumad's threats on James's life during TwitchCon. He couldn't even go home because he knew his address and was en route to Vegas after threats. He had to use our hotel room to hide out while waiting for law enforcement. Can back this up too. He was scared for his life at the partner lounge during TwitchCon Vegas and talked to security at the event because of threats made towards himself. James elaborated on his perspective. When my friends and colleagues say that my life was in constant danger, they're not talking about just threats. Within a short time frame, I had a bullet hole put in my office window, was told to wear a sealed bulletproof vest when I'm in public, witnessed a SWAT team with ballistic shields outside of my home, and had to cooperate with an anti-terrorism unit when the fist made implications of people's lives being in my control at TwitchCon, leading to the entire convention center being surrounded by police SUVs. This isn't even all the things I, my colleagues, and my close ones had to endure, just to give a perspective. I don't think I need to explain why I was not talking about it publicly, but if multiple people coming forward confirming what I said isn't true enough, a lot of information is now public records and can be accessed by anyone. There was never a lawsuit at any point. There were court orders that led to multiple cases, civil and criminal. Once again, there has never been a lawsuit. A lot of these things are public records and always have been. It was never about money. He lied to the public and some morons ate it up despite court cases being public records. The justice courts in multiple jurisdictions deemed it necessary to provide restraining orders to protect the victims and witnesses and those around him. The burden of proof is on the prosecution and it was met in full. The courts issued multiple permanent restraining orders for many of his victims as he was vicious, unhinged and violent, going out of his way to hurt not just his victims but those who are close to him, all just to inflict maximum damage on everyone he's hurt. Tim Ad has been caught destroying evidence, sending death threats to witnesses, and fabricating stuff to brainwash his audience. The judge shut down his lies during the hearing, and all of this is public records. Just a reminder that this guy got caught hiding in the course cafeteria when he realized he would have to see one of his victims in person again. This is the same guy who was dancing on the grave of a murdered child just a year ago. This is the same guy who secretly recorded multiple videos of him committing crimes, including SA and pointing a gun at one of his victims. He shared those videos with friends, but was more to find out the court had gotten a hold of them. This is public records once again. I was told the arrest warrant was supposed to go just before the final overdose. There are multiple reasons why it took so long. The main reason being that the investigation involved many jurisdictions in multiple states and the amount of everything they had to go through has been insane. Outside of direct messages, phone calls, and live streams, he tweeted over 17,200 times since August alone. Also, some people interfered with the investigation and I'm waiting on confirmation whose names I can bring up today. All while, a lot of information is public or will soon be made public by the authorities. 
please don't bring up the victim's names and don't wish ill will on Tumad's family. Jameski claims that Tumad illegally owned firearms. However, he claimed on my live stream that he didn't own any. So you don't yeah. own any real guns. That's what I was going to say because you're a Canadian citizen. You're not, and you're in California, right? So like, what was the... Yeah, I don't own any guns. But apart from that, these are some very heavy accusations. This 13-year-old in the mental hospital was determined to be a girl named Misty, who Tumad apparently had some level of contact with. Jameski said that he continued to prey on the vulnerable even after the police got involved, including a 13-year-old in a mental hospital. If you look at her posts and his posts, you can see that the two clearly interacted publicly. Tumad had reposted a video from her account of this apparent mental institution, and he also posted a tweet of her outfit. Now, this is definitely weird and something to be concerned about. A 23-year-old being online friends with a 13-year-old is odd. But as for any inappropriate contact, there was none at the time, and she herself denied it when the accusations initially came out. Another person who spoke about this drama was just a minx. Minx quote tweeted James and called his tweet insane, while clarifying she supported the lawsuit and investigations into Tumad. James then responded accusing Minx of interfering with the investigations and providing confidential information to Medea. He says Minx knew there was never a lawsuit and that she switched sides constantly. He then uploads two clips of Minx talking about Medea. I think he wants, I think he's just trying to cope because he has none left to live for, which I understand because he has none. Yeah, I hope he gets help too. And by help, I mean I hope he learns how to tie a noose in a video game. The second clip shows her revealing publicly they could use her phone calls to track him. Then Medea calls her on stream, confirming that he's listening. Well, answering his calls, this dumbass doesn't realize when I answer them, I can track his location. Not me personally, sorry. The police can and see where it came from. If I don't answer it, I can't. And that's what they advised me to do. They said, don't talk to him, just answer it. And then you just show us the call and they can track where he goes to right now. Oh, look, he's calling again. Minx claimed the only way she could have interfered is by the report she made to the LAPD of him stalking and threatening her or mentioning other cases. James posts a clip of her doing this, which she disputes unsuccessfully. These two were really going at it, and it's clear behind the scenes there have been a lot going on. Minx posted some images from the lawsuit and alluded to releasing the lawyer's name. The most notable screenshot posted by James, meanwhile, are pages of Tumad posing with various guns, of which many include verifiably fake guns, as I said before. If he did own any real guns, there was no evidence based on these tweets. Following this, a few girls also came forward forward, claiming they had been harassed by Tumad with incessant messages, much in the same way he did to Goldie Bell. Keep in mind, he didn't know these girls at all, he just did this at random. These statements left a lot of room for speculation. Where was the proof of Ophelia? Where was the proof that this bullet hole in the window was from Tumad? Where was the proof of the SWAT team arriving, apart from this blurry image? Detractors of James saw him dancing on the grave of a dead man, skirting around a defamation lawsuit, because, well, you cannot defame someone who is dead. Others saw Tumad's prior behavior and instantly believed these claims. It would be weeks before James posted his follow-up up evidence, but it did eventually come, in the form of a 52-page document. The document opens by painting Tumad as a narcissistic crazy person, one who didn't even trust his own intentions and thought he may commit a violent crime against Jameski or against someone else. That I'm still like madly infatuated with this fucking bitch. Why? Yeah, because it's like, I touched her that one time, and then she sued me, and that's why I must get my ultimate revenge ultimate revenge yeah a lot of people like to scare themselves into thinking i'm like a harmless person i could be right but and it's and it's worthwhile do your due diligence to make sure that doesn't happen but i think if i go into schizo mode for real what's more likely is i'm going to do a mixed skillet or like getting a bunch of crimes before i go and commit murder i try to avoid that i definitely try to avoid that 100%. For the unaware, McSkillet drove his car over the speed limit against traffic and killed two people in 2018. You drop the Oh, I'm gonna fucking kill this. Are you stupid? No, I mean, I don't mean to. What do you mean? Come on! I understand that you you're like you're in the end game of life when you've just begun, and you don't have any anger towards anyone ever. But like you have to understand, I'm not fucking married like you. I think this is probably the most fair allegation that James makes, and is just an extension of what we already knew. Tumad was clearly a deeply mentally ill person, and from these clips, I don't think you can claim all of them are jokes. The guy definitely was out of his mind. The rest of the document is full of a lot of claims. That 13-year-old in the mental hospital named Misty is never mentioned. He does claim that his public knowledge 
acknowledged Tumet had expressed predatory behavior and shows that through a few different tweets. And while these messages do look horrible, it's my belief that in these contexts, Tumet was making some very crude jokes. There's no proof in this document or elsewhere that Tumet had any inappropriate contact with a minor, and we've never seen any evidence of such. However, James claims that he's been working with multiple victims of Medea for months on a criminal investigation, people he intends to keep anonymous to protect their privacy. This would be separate from the civil case with Goldie Bell, and in his words, the government was already preparing everything necessary for the prosecution. The criminal investigation had nothing to do with the civil case and criminal contempt related to violating the civil order. What the government knew, or even what this is about, is not explained in detail at this moment in the doc. What is talked about is details from the civil trial. James claims that at one point, Tumad read a statement written by ChatGPT, which was then quickly shut down by the judge. He even has a court transcript for this. He goes back to talking about Goldie Bell at this point, and the various clips of Tumad saying, I'll do it again, as well as the moments from my stream in which he admitted to plying Goldie Bell with drugs to make her more susceptible to his advances. Hey Tumad, quick question, when you tried to give weed, was it to sort of ease her into finally giving you coochie? That's for five from Pullbun. I think so. Yeah, that, yeah. I feel like that's obvious though, right? Like I don't usually, I've, I've never done that before. But that, like that's kind of why you do drugs. Like I remember when I was like 14, I was like, a girl rejected me and I was like, I should smoke weed. I fucking did it. Fuck em. I'd do it again. You know, bro, but you know you can't, bro. They're gonna use I, this in court. I can. I know they can use it. Fuck y'all. I'm sorry, okay, my bad, dog. Well, I'm paying my lawyer top dollar to explain it to them, that's just humor and fucking. Ultimately, what this part of the document does well, in terms of things that can be proven, is make Tumad look unhinged. It shows that in his final days, he was so drugged out he didn't even trust himself to not do something horrible. That, in and of itself, makes Tumad basically impossible to defend, which is why I'm not gonna do that. But as for the multiple other victims James claims exist, they are nowhere to be found. On page 22, he shows a DM of someone, who knows who, messaging another person, who knows who, about Tumad, where they say they mashed on Tinder. The other person says they mashed on Hinge. What this means or proves, I do not know. All it shows is that someone claimed they matched with Tumed on a dating app. James also claims Tumed went as far as to meet multiple of these girls in person. It includes a blurred out video of Tumed supposedly meeting some girl. See, I get bitches. See? <laughs> Even if I'm to take both of these extremely out of context materials seriously, all I can deduce is that Tumad met a girl on a dating app and then met her in real life. This is the most proof we get, by the way, apart from some gross tweets that Tumad made. To make extremely strong public accusations about pedophilia and say there will be more details and then never reveal any of those details beyond a few screenshots that could be chalked up to jokes is very irresponsible. I understand James Key claims that there is evidence he cannot reveal because the victims don't want to be identified, but you could always censor names much like he did for Goldie Bell. If he censored it for her, why not censor it for them? Well, this leaves us with a few possibilities. The first is that these victims are real. Too Mad is guilty of all of this, and they refuse to let James Key publicize any proof, even with the addition of censoring their names. The second option is that James Key preemptively tweeted about these allegations, believing they would want to go public, and they did not, putting him in a difficult position. The third option is that James believes Tumad to be a creep based off of these screenshots, but has no actual proof beyond that. The fourth option is that James is intentionally lying. Whichever of these possibilities it is, making a tweet claiming that Tumad is the worst thing you could possibly be after his death, and then never revealing details is retarded, and should make you question what his motivations are and what happened behind the scenes. James claims there's an investigation that happened behind the scenes, which is why he's recorded calls to the LAPD. But if that investigation was actually underway in a serious manner, James James doesn't prove it, and he probably never will. James also claimed publicly that he saved Tumad's life and prevented a mass tragedy. I have no proof of this. Did Tumad do horrible things, bad things we know about? Yes. Is he a pedophile who groomed people and sexually assaulted multiple people? Right. I don't, I honestly think James Key thinks this, and I don't know that he's lying, but I don't have evidence of it either. Right, yeah, like specifically, obviously, like, okay, we're pretty much accepting now, like the pedophilia thing, like he's not providing proof for, he's still kind of claiming it's a thing, right? But He's uh, saying because the victims don't want it, don't want their identities public, he can't release yeah. it. Yeah, right, but, yeah. But um, I just, I don't know James Key, so am I to trust that? I don't really know. What I'm more interested in is gaining context into the scenarios where he claims that he saved Tumad's life, right? Or prevented tragedy, right? Like, what, what is the context of that, right? Um, <laughs> hmm. Yeah, they're saying, they, they're, he's saying he prevented a mass shooting like four times, basically, right? Right, but he's also saying that he uh, intervened to save Tumad's life in the past, which is confusing to me because it's like, what does that mean? You just called the cops on him and then they went to do a wellness check? Like, what is that? 
In this document, James accuses the LAPD of corruption and incompetence. On page 33, he says that the Southern California police in general are notorious for their misconduct and not doing anything in their power until it's too late. He says that if you check the Wikipedia article for the LAPD alone, the section about their corruption and misconduct is half of the entire article. However, throughout this, he fails to show even one instance of police incompetence, never mind corruption. He claims that when Tumad violated his restraining order, they refused to act unless the court told them to. We're not going to go over there and break his door down and take it down. But this is actually what the police are supposed to do. It's called obtaining a warrant. A warrant is signed by a judge and is basically a permission slip for them to go inside someone's home. The police cannot indiscriminately bust down someone's door unless they believe there's an imminent threat to someone's well-being or life behind that door. For them to bust down someone's door just because James said so would be actual incompetence and corruption and would probably result in some kind of suspension for officers involved. Frankly, if there was enough evidence for arrest, he'd be in jail if he wasn't dead. On page three, James called too mad a criminal, actually guilty of committing a Class C felony, to be precise. Not sure why, because Tumat has never been charged with a felony and is not a felon. Unless James means he committed a felonious crime and thus should be a felon, in which case he should be far more specific with what he means here. As for what that crime may be, it's never proven. But James claims this separate criminal case was just about to close in. We already knew Tumat was going to be arrested. The government was preparing everything necessary. The criminal investigation had nothing to do with a civil case. This is a ridiculous thing for me to believe. I'm supposed to believe James knew he was going to be arrested? How? Did the police personally inform him of every step of the investigation? Is he a detective? The amount of knowledge he supposedly has is pretty absurd. He claims Tumad had illegal firearms and the police were investigating it. On page 36, he said, I'll make it very clear for the last time the investigation into his possession of illegal firearms was conducted by professionals in real life, not Twitter detectives. The existence of real firearms had been proven many times and authorities were just trying to figure out where they came from. Tumad tried to dispose of those firearms and it made the investigation significantly more complicated as a result. Okay, so I'll make this clear, very clear. If the police had proof Tumad not only illegally owned firearms on U.S. soil, but was also doing it despite the restraining order and was trying to dispose of them, he would have been formally charged and arrested full stop. There is no reason for any alternative. But James has an explanation for this too. You see, the cops were actually trying to catch whoever sold it to him first, and then take the dangerous schizophrenic man's guns. On page 37, he writes, Imagine how complicated it is when the end goal, from the law's perspective, is to destroy the supply and not the customer, because you will only solve one problem and not be the source of many. I think it goes without saying that it's obvious that if there's somebody out there who can supply firearms to psychopaths like Tumad without actually being noticed by authorities, this is a huge source of problems. That's why the investigation into Tumad's firearms was so extensive and the main reason why nobody was allowed to talk about it. James keeps claiming here that the police are not catching Tumad for having illegal firearms so they can wait to catch the bigger fish. This is an insane allegation and that's actually clear police misconduct if true. Unless the FBI is investigating Tumad and he's a member of an organized crime family, it is super illegal for the cops to not take those guns, especially if they believe he's a dangerous person. Having guns is a violation of his TRO, and if they're illegal guns, then that's also illegal. The cops would not wait. This is not the FBI. They're not investigating the mafia. And once again, how would James Key know this? Does he personally know the chief of police? Is he a detective? Is he being clued into their every move? It's possible Tumad possessed real guns, but if the police had proof he had illegally obtained weapons, he'd have been in jail and caught a charge full stop. But James claims he spent six figures on an investigation to the point where he had to sell his car to pay for it. But you don't pay the police to investigate someone. They do that with taxpayer dollars. So who did this? Who are these real life professionals, not Twitter detectives that James is referencing? Well, the only thing that would make sense here is that James hired a private investigator and paid them to investigate too mad personally. But apparently that PI couldn't find enough for the cops to arrest the guy at any point in time. If the police have reason to believe a schizophrenic retarded Canadian person has illegal firearms, they will arrest them and then figure out where they're from, not the other way around. One of the initial claims that James Key made on Twitter was that too mad had put a bullet hole through his office window. Well, a YouTuber named Henry Resilient was actually able to obtain a copy of the lawsuit James Key filed against Tumad, and in it we get a bit more explanation of what this is about. We found a bullet hole in oh office God. room of my house in Los Angeles. <laughs> Witnessed a full SWAT team raid a house across of where I reside and had my ex-roommate's family address used for false swatting attempt. Neither I or my roommates feel ourselves safe anywhere we go, and especially at our home. It seems that in reality, what happened was that James found a bullet hole in his window and assumed it was from Tumad. I mean, the guy lives in Los Angeles, depending on where you live. It's not entirely unlikely that bullets are whizzing around. The same applies for James's claim he was swatted by Tumad. The funny thing is, James didn't even get swatted. The house across from him did. James just saw the SWAT team and assumed that Tumad called them there, but got the address wrong. Additionally, if there was proof he swatted anyone, or shot 
about James Key's window, it would be a criminal investigation, not a civil suit like James filed. Swatting is an offense punishable by major jail time, as is shooting someone's window in an attempt to kill them. If the police or anyone had proved Tumad did either of these things, he would have been in jail long before his death. There wouldn't have been a waiting game. We don't actually even have proof that a swatting happened. The police actually could have been there for any reason. But James carefully worded his public tweets about this so as to make it as extreme as possible to make everyone think that Tumad personally swatted him. So what happened at TwitchCon? Multiple of James's friends came out and said they could confirm that James was in serious danger because of something Tumad did or said. On page 8, James writes, During TwitchCon Las Vegas, Tumad made ominous threats towards me and the public. To my knowledge, he didn't explicitly make a statement that he planned to up the convention center, and I have no idea where this rumor originates. However, he did make numerous concerning threats, some of which directly referenced me and other people he's held a deadly grudge against. The convention center and the public were aware of his threats before I had a chance to speak to any first responders. When the threats began, I was told urgently to talk to people at the central station, where they acknowledged that the sheriff and convention were already aware of the situation. According to the investigation, Tumad was actively looking for me specifically, but implied that others would also be affected using me as a reason. James even claims he was placed under police protection during the ordeal to hide from the threat of Medea Sadiq. During that night, the authorities deemed it necessary to shelter me at a remote location to ensure my safety. He then shows a message from him at the police station. Apparently, he was there at 541, and then he was still there 40 minutes later, and then he left at 630. How do I know he was at the police station during this time when he was talking to the cops? Well, he filed a police report at 6 o'clock, and the address for the report is the police station. There's no detail here apart from the fact James claims some threats were made, and that's literally it in the police report. Now, James does have some unhinged videos of Tumad from this time. Kill. Do the Mario. Kill? Who? You know. Burn them all. And given how generally unhinged Tumad is, it's not surprising James felt threatened by him in some way. But the main problem here is, once again, the lack of evidence around statements he makes about what happened here. James claims the investigation also determined he was in a state of psychosis during his last live stream before going to Las Vegas and that he'd talked to himself. How would anyone know he was experiencing psychosis without the evaluation of a medical professional? How would this be declared literally anywhere if the guy was never arrested? And additionally, how would James know that the investigation determined this? Do the police typically inform civilians of every step of the prosecution so they know police business inside and out? Well, the answer is no. We also have no indication James was held anywhere or under police protection. I think, in reality, he was just at the station. That is the remote location. If the police are willing to put someone under protection because they believe with a credible source or reason that their life is in danger, it's also typical that they will, you know, mobilize a police response to arrest the guy who was armed and dangerous. Do you think that happened? No, it did not. But according to James, Tumad turned around before he got there in his secret car. I had to wait for a while to be updated on whether it was safe to return home, and I spent most of my time at a friend group's Airbnb the next day. The investigation found that Tumad did not use his primary, legally registered Tesla with a real license plate to enter Nevada. The investigation was aware he had two nearly identical Teslas, one of which was bought via private sale and wasn't registered to his name, making it more challenging to track down Tumad. However, I've been told that after Tumad realized the level of police response to his actions, he decided to drive back home and make ominous paranoid posts with various threats at the end. So Tumad had a separate, identical Tesla he purchased purchased illegally, which is also a crime. You can be fined or arrested for driving a car with a plate that isn't registered to you, and you can easily be pulled over for having your registration out of date. Never mind owning an unmarked car that doesn't exist in the system and isn't registered to you. Is this guy a double agent? Is Tumad Jason Bourne? If there was proof of any of this, don't you think the dude would be in jail? And now that Tumad is dead of a possible overdose, where is this extra car? Where are these extra guns? Now keep in mind, there is still a possibility this is real. Maybe he did have an extra secret unmarked car, and maybe he did own all these illegal firearms, but James didn't provide proof of any of it, and if he wants to make this claim, he needs to for the general public to believe it. Additionally, keep in mind every time James says the investigation, he's not referencing the police, usually anyway. It's probably his private investigator he hired, and this document gets even crazier as time goes on. One major claim by James was that Isabella and Tumad were never actually dating. Now, I don't know if they were official at any point, but it's clear that at some point they did know each other and were hanging out regularly. She admitted to willingly going to his home before the alleged assault took place, so this doesn't really make sense and according to James, she was never paid for sex. On page 44, he writes that the prostitution was also entirely made up by Tumad in an attempt to discredit the victim in the public eye. The investigation fully debunked it, including the fake messages he posted on Twitter that his fans took as gospel at the time, which is brought up later again in this document. Now, it's possible the messages are fake, and Tumad is the master of faking messages, but this is never proven. It's not proven later in this document. Tumad multiple times claimed his relationship with Goldie Bell began with him paying her for sex. He even posted these messages to 
corroborate this claim. Goldie Bell herself never even claimed Too Mad faked these messages in her own court case or on Twitter. I guess it's possible he fakes them, but I'm gonna need a little more than the guy who understands nothing about the criminal justice system to believe it. On page 35, he writes that the court instructed the police they were supposed to arrest Too Mad. The authorities always argued it was a different police department's job. This is the definition of weaponized ignorance and incompetence. The instances provided throughout this document are just a few examples. There were countless instances that were way worse. All right, so I'm gonna have to do a little work to dissect what James Key is saying here, but here's what this means. As per Too Mad's restraining order, he was not supposed to contact Isabella or harass her online. Despite that, he tweeted about her multiple times, and as a result, that can be seen as a violation of the temporary restraining order. Goldie Bell's lawyer then filed paperwork claiming that Too Mad violated that order, and he should be held in contempt of the court. All of this is publicly documented. What's also publicly documented is the strain between Too Mad and his lawyer. Towards the end of the court proceedings, Too Mad's relationship with his lawyer was strained. It's not clear why exactly, and ultimately it's held under attorney-client privilege, but we could guess Too Mad wasn't paying him properly towards the end. Whatever the case, in court, his lawyer argued Too Mad may not even be mentally competent to stand trial. Therefore, serving him this contempt order is an issue because he may not even understand what's going on. He asked for a continuance in the case to make preparations before Too Mad is formally charged with the contempt order. I'm stating to the court that I don't believe that he has the capacity to understand the nature of the proceedings today and cannot proceed on his behalf. This is covering his ass. This is some CYA stuff. I don't understand why Too Mad wouldn't understand it being served, but also Too Mad cannot proceed in pro per to go for it with the arraignment. So Too Mad needs a lawyer for the contempt hearing because it's criminal. Now keep in mind here, just because Too Mad was served does not mean he is convicted. He was served the contempt order, but the judge had not ruled on it yet. If he was convicted, it's possible he would actually get some jail time. Now at that later date, Too Mad's lawyer spoke to Goldie Bell's lawyer and they actually mutually decided to drop the contempt order, meaning he would not be arrested. No warrant was ever issued, so he didn't need to be arrested. Too Mad's lawyer then stops representing him at the end of the case and Too Mad represents himself. In court, at the final moments of the case, Goldie Bell states in court that she has continued to be harassed by Too Mad and fears for her life because she believes he owns real firearms. She even says that she believes he swatted her. Too Mad denies this, saying he has not directly texted Goldie Bell since 2022 and has no desire to harm anyone, including her. Too Mad also says he doesn't own any firearms. Goldie Bell's lawyer rebuttals, saying that he does, submitting the video from the front door, which we now believe is a video of Too Mad with a fake gun, and submits a video of Too Mad on his balcony where he supposedly fires a gun into the air. Too Mad claims this video is fake and is edited for YouTube. Goldie Bell's lawyer has no evidence to the contrary, and as a result, he doesn't even argue. So Too Mad is not arrested, and instead, the restraining order that Goldie Bell requested at the beginning of the case is basically upgraded to a restraining order for a period of three years for the harassment, not for any violence or threat of violence, and once again, Too Mad is never ordered to be arrested. James Key's problem here is that the court didn't arrest Too Mad, but a warrant was never issued. The court case was concluded without any need for him to be arrested. James Key paid six figures and went into debt to get this guy behind behind bars and still couldn't do it. What does that tell you? Well, in the eyes of the law, Too Mad is innocent of owning a gun or making attempts on anyone's life. If there was evidence to convict, he'd be arrested and charged. Ultimately, I'm not that concerned with going after James Key. If he lied, then he'll get his in due time, but this document is bad and ultimately leaves more questions than answers. If you want my personal opinion, James is a very paranoid person who believes that a lot is happening when it just is not. On page 33, James shows a money spread of police reports. A police report, by the way, just means someone claimed a crime was committed and told a police officer. It's not proof of an active investigation or proof of someone being charged with a crime by the government. Now, for my video, I actually had someone call up a few police departments. Here's a quote of what the Culver City PD said about the report filed to them. On June 26, 2023, Isabella and James Prime came to the apartment lobby to report criminal threats made by Isabella's previous intimate partner. She was saying that she met him in November 2021. She said they were together for a month to the police. Claims he had possibly sexually assaulted her, came in to report threats from messages he had sent on social media. Took it as a courtesy for Inglewood PD. No follow-up. For the record, every police station we were able to contact said basically the same thing. In my opinion, at the end of this, there are three distinct possibilities. One is that James Key is knowingly lying, and two is that James Key has no understanding of the criminal justice system or chain of evidence or anything. And possibility three. Somehow, some way, everything in this document is true, and he just refuses to post evidence of all of it. Also, the California police are the worst government body in the world, and everyone involved needs to be sent to the moon. Either way, based on this document, his word is basically nothing. You can believe James wrote this all and conducted his $100,000 investigation and had to get rid of his car for the right reasons. You can believe it's because he's been obsessed with Too Mad for years. I don't really care. What I do know is that he made some extremely strong accusations off the bat as soon as he found out that someone died, and then he 
didn't prove any of them. The final update on all of this is that Misty, the 13-year-old, also recently sent out a message, once again saying she was never groomed by Tumad in any way. One of the things that stuck out to me the most from my interview with Tumad was when he told Gokunairu and I that he had no one helping him through the most trying time of his life. Tumad began his YouTube career as a loner. Alone in his bedroom, he had no friends, and could only fathom sinking his time into playing Overwatch. He died alone in his apartment with no friends to help him, high on ketamine, playing Overwatch. Tumad is not innocent. We don't have proof of him being a rapist or a file, and this is something I hope Jameski can account for in due time. But what we do know is that he became absolutely obsessed with this girl. He begged her for attention, he slammed her with incoherent memes and diatribes about how she needs him, and he's the only path forward for her. He definitely pressured her into sex repeatedly, and whatever you want to call the interactions of that night, what he personally described to me is already pretty over the line. And he tried to do the same to like 20 other girls. He obsessed over them, he sent them random messages, and I know if they agreed, he would have met up with them probably high on ketamine, and who knows what would have happened there. Thankfully, they were smart enough to not play into his behavior. He was also a very deeply lonely person. No matter what, he couldn't seem to break down the barrier of flesh and air between him and other people. When he did try to, he deeply hurt many of them in ways some described as sociopathic. His empathy for others seemed to be at an all-time low, and his regard for himself was only in that he could continue behaving like a schizophrenic online. He tried to cope with his reality with substances, which actually only pushed him further from people and into a hole he couldn't climb out of. No one's advice impacted him whatsoever in his final days. Nobody was able to get through to him. He just wanted to rot. In his final months, Tumad identified a lot with Light Yagami, a sociopathic genius who was always 23 steps ahead of everyone else, acting to save the world. But ultimately, the problem with Light was his ego and callousness. He didn't write the names of criminals in the Death Note to do the right thing. He did it because he thought he was better than everyone else. It clouded his judgment, and it led him to do things that no one could forgive. And no matter what he did, Light was always alone. He had no genuine emotional connection with anyone. I guess it makes sense why Tumad resonated with his story so much, even if at the time he couldn't realize how that would end. I think Tumad, Medea Sadiq, whatever you want to call him, should be remembered. You, you can't deny his influence, but he was a very complicated person. And ultimately, his shitty behavior, inability to cope with the world around him, and drug addiction led to his untimely death at the age of 23 years old. For those he hurt, they have a right to be thankful he won't hurt them anymore. For those who liked him as a person or enjoyed his content, they have every right to miss him too. As for the moral of this story, um, I don't know. Don't do drugs or something. Uh, don't be an asshole. Don't isolate yourself from everyone in the world because no matter, no matter how much you convince yourself that you're all you need, that will never be the case. You need other people around you to feel human. Clearly, uh, clearly too mad didn't feel that. I've been Turkey Tom. Thanks for watching. And until next time, good night, girl. I'll see I'll you tomorrow. See you tomorrow. I'll see you in the next episode. Too mad out.